We are. Are we good to start or should we wait for more people? We should probably start. Um, yeah. A lot of people rely on the fact that we're recording this so that they can just watch it at YouTube afterwards but yeah. um, and sleep in. But yeah, whenever you like. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to day two of MWM project meeting. It's possibly the transient day. Uh, and we'll kick that off with Sam McSweeney as our first speaker, giving us a talk about a review of MWA polarization. Sammy, do you want to share your screen? I will give you a two minute warning and people are encouraged to ask questions on the chat or you can unmute yourself and then ask questions. Whenever okay. you're ready. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you can see my screen. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I'm I'm giving this talk on the lands of the Wajak Noongar people whose lands were never ceded, and I would like to pay my respects, my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, now my talk is part review and part call to arms for solving a problem that has been really lurking in the wings for years and years and is probably affecting everyone's data uh, to some level or another. Um, so, as you can tell from the title slide, it has to do with uh, polarimetry. And so, before getting to the problem itself, um, and in order to get as many people on board as possible, I'm going to start with a quick primer on polarization. Also, very quickly, um, I do have some animations in my slides, so hopefully they're coming across not too glitchy. But afterwards, when we give these slides uh, for everybody to see later, I'll also give the repo where I've made all of my animations. So if anybody wants to use them, they can they can make them themselves. Um, so uh, what is polarization and why do we care? We'll all be familiar with the textbook illustration of a propagating electromagnetic wave where the electric field oscillates at some arbitrary frequency here in this diagram and the magnetic field oscillates perpendicularly to the electric field and the oscillate the oscillations propagate in some direction at the speed of light. And all of this, of course, drops right out of Maxwell's equations. Now, there's nothing special about the orientation I've chosen for the electric and magnetic fields. I could equally well have chosen this picture instead. But things get really interesting when you play around with another property of electromagnetic waves, namely that you can superpose them, which is to say that you can add the vectors of two electromagnetic waves at each point in space and time, and the result you get <clears throat> is guaranteed to also be a solution of Maxwell's equations. For example, if you add together one wave where the electric field is propagating in one plane, and another wave where the electric field is propagating in another plane perpendicular to the first one, and if the second one is retarded by a quarter of a phase relative to the first one, you can get really cool looking waves like this. But the question is, what is really the full range of possibilities that we can get? So let's make it easier for ourselves first by ignoring this magnetic field, which we can do because Ma uh, Maxwell's equations tell us how to reconstruct the magnetic field from a time varying electric field. So in the context of electric ma electromagnetic waves in a vacuum, it's uh, redundant information. This animation represents how the wave might be propagating through 3D space in this case, along this long axis here. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Um, <clears throat> but in practice, we never get to sample the electric field everywhere, but only in one spot, say, wherever we play some kind of measuring device, like, like our eye, for instance. So from the detector's rather limited point of view, it would only uh, see the electric field vector at one point tracing out some shape in the plane perpendicular to the direction of propagation. So what shapes are possible? 
at a single frequency, the most general shape you can get is an ellipse, and we collectively call the eccentricity and orientation of this ellipse the wave's polarization state. And the terms linear and circular polarization are really just two special cases, linear being an ellipse with an eccentricity of one, that is, the electric field vector just oscillates along some line, um, and circular being an ellipse with eccentricity zero. So the electric field vector just traces out a circle. Things get more complicated when you start to superpose waves, waves of different frequencies because the resulting trace of the electric field at a given point in space is no longer constrained just to be an ellipse. In fact, if you choose random polarization states for each frequency over some range, you end up with the electric field vector following a random path in the perpendicular plane. So to describe this kind of light, instead of looking at how the electric field evolves instantaneously over time, we instead look at some of its low order statistics over some finite time and or frequency range, a distribution, if you will. So these low order statistics are called Stokes parameters, um, but in the interests of time, I'm afraid I can't, I can only spare one quick slide to explain them very briefly. For this talk, the main things you need to know is that Stokes I is total power. Stokes Q and U describe the linear polarization component and its orientation. And Stokes V describes the circular polarization and the sense in which it, it rotates. Why do we care about polarization? Again, in the interest of time, I only have time to give one motivating example of how you can do astrophysics with polarization. So because it's me giving this talk, I'll pick an example from pulsars. Um, here is an example of a light curve of a pulsar averaged over many pulses. This light curve is the total intensity, or as we've just learned, Stokes I. And this actually was one of the first uh, pulsars to be discovered. Um, and when they look at its polarization properties, they saw that the intrinsic polarization state was strongly linearly polarized and that the angle of the polarization ellipse changed smoothly as a function of the pulsar's rotation. They hypothesized that the angle of the polarization was actually associated with the projected angle of the pulsar's dipolar magnetic field lines um, under the observer's line of sight at a given moment. Hence, they inferred that the emission must be arising from a region around the pulsar, which was far enough from the surface so that the dipolar component of its magnetic field dominated, but not so high that the magnetic field could no longer co-rotate with the pulsar without violating special relativity. So in my mind, this is a spectacular demonstration of how a simple observation of polar polarization uh, helped constrain astrophysics or pulsar electrodynamics in this case. So given that we care about polarization, what does it take to get a full measurement of the polarization state of a source? For this discussion, I'm just going to go back to the monochromatic case, a single frequency, where the light is always 100% polarized. And the electric vector traces out an ellipse. If you happen to have a dipole antenna, you could position it in some orientation, say, uh, say the horizontal direction, and what you'll get is the incident electric field generating a voltage across the dipole, which is proportional to the component of the incident field projected onto that dipole. If you have a second dipole, you could orientate it vertically and you can sample both the horizontal and vertical components of the electric field. As long as you keep track of the relative phase offset between the voltage response of the two dipoles, you can perfectly reconstruct the incident electric field. Now, really, the premise of this whole talk is the following statement. Keeping track of the relative phase offset between these two dipoles is hard. What happens if you do get the phase offset between the two dipoles wrong? You would, of course, infer the wrong polarization state. <clears throat> How do we avoid this? By a process of calibration, of course. If you have a known source of polarized light, and if you have a model for, of how your receiving elements uh, should respond to that incident light, you can predict what the amplitudes and relative phase difference should be, and then compare your prediction to what you actually measure and adjust things accordingly. What we want then is a so-called calibration solution, 
which means a set of amplitude and phase corrections you need to apply to your voltage measurements to make your inferred electric field match the true incident electric field. Now we have calibration software for doing this, but, and this is really the, the main sentence I wanna say in this talk, the calibration solutions we are getting out of our MWA pipelines are demonstrably wrong. Okay, so that's, that's a strong statement. So <laughs> maybe I should water it down a little bit. I'll say instead, some, some of the calibration solutions that we are getting out of some of our MWA pipelines are known to be wrong. So here is a schematic of how all MWA calibration pipelines work. There are three basic ingredients. Number one, the actual data recorded from the telescope. Number two, a model of how the front end part of the telescope actually responds to the incident radiation from different directions, where the front end here includes both the antenna elements themselves, as well as, in this case, the analog beamformer, which makes our primary beam. Um, and uh, you need a model of what you expect the sky to actually look like so that you can actually make a prediction of what your data should look like. All of these ingredients get fed into some calibration software, which spits out a set of, of solutions. Now, if the calibration solutions you are getting are incorrect, then it really could be any of these components highlighted in red that could be at fault. Your B model could be wrong, your sky model could be wrong, or you might even simply have a bug in your software. It doesn't make sense, of course, to say that the data could be wrong because uh, we knew it was wrong at the outset and finding out how it is wrong is the whole point of the exercise. So keep these three possibilities in mind when in a minute I show you an example of data to which a faulty calibration solution has been applied. Now this example is from the Pulsar group, uh, but I know of examples with similar symptoms from the GEG, GEG group and the EOR group as well. Now, of course, with any one particular example, I have to be upfront about which beam model was used, which sky model was used and which calibration software was used. So in this example, uh, we happen to use the FEE beam, a Stokes I sky model of the brighter sources within the primary beam um, and the RTS uh, software. And if you're suspicious about our use of the RTS, um, which is now quite old software and has been updated, so you should be suspicious, rest assured that I could show other examples where different calibration software was used. This example is just the one I happened to have on hand when I was preparing this talk. So this is a plot of how the measured polarization state of a pulsar changes as a function of observing frequency. Now I'm betting that most people looking at this plot will not immediately be able to see uh, that something is wrong. So I'll take you through it very briefly. What you would expect to see from a pulsar after the intervening interstellar medium has had its Faraday rotation away with it is a set of oscillating, oscillating Q and U which is there in blue and orange, and a mostly constant V. However, it looks like V is oscillating in some way, which is something that Faraday rotation absolutely can't explain. So this is strong evidence that polarization leakage has occurred. We're getting the polarization state wrong, which in turn indicates that something has gone awry in the calibration solution that was used in this particular case. So having identified that there is an issue, the problem is now to use the measured polarization to deduce the error in the calibration solution that caused this leakage. Um, now, as Natasha mentioned during Dev's talk yesterday, during the questions, this exercise has, as, has been done with a lot of hard work by the Gling team, with the lion's share of the work done by Xiang but with contributions from a lot of people right across the MWA collaboration. So to be brief, Shang was able to map the measurable leakage between uh, U and V in, the, in that case, directly to an extra uh, needed phase correction that changes to first order linearly with frequency according to this, this formula here. Uh, this information, uh, this is the source they used in green, and all of this information is on the MWA wiki at this uh, URL. Now, a few comments about this solution. First, um, across 30 megahertz, 
Uh, this solution equates to about 13 and a half degrees uh, change of uh, a phase from one end of the band to the other. So this can understandably lead to significant leakage somewhere in your band if you don't correct for it. Another point is, um, the second point mainly directed to those of you who might be interested in this plus 28 degrees over here, uh, that you might think uh, it's indicative of a non-delay like effect. I won't say what that, this is just for people who already know what I'm talking about. In this particular case, uh, it isn't necessarily indicative of a non-delay type effect because this correction equation is just a fit to actually quite noisy data across a relatively short lever arm in frequency. And it is likely that the intercept at zero frequency is actually consistent with zero phase within the errors of this fit. But if you are interested in that kind of thing, I'll just throw in a teaser about having actual evidence that I'm not presenting here that the phase offsets in the calibration solutions really are not delay like. So if you're interested, ask me later for more details. So now that the Glean team have published this solution, the natural question is, can, can anybody just take this solution and apply it and apply it to their calibration solutions and expect that the leakage will largely go away? And the answer to that is definitely, it depends. On the one hand, the Glean team found that they were able to apply the same solution to observations spanning years uh, from 20, 2018 to 2020, I think. So it seems that whatever the cause of the leakage is, it appears to be stable in time. I have also independently verified this stability, although not Gleam's specific solution, for a set of VCS observations taken for the Smart Pulsar survey using the phase two compact configuration. Here is a plot of the relative phase differences between the east-west and north-south arms, that is the polarizations of each MWA tile or rather the slopes of those phase differences across the 140 to 170 megahertz band um, expressed in terms of uh, an equivalent time delay between those two polarizations. As you can see, uh, the x-axis spans years and these, uh, uh, these points are relatively stable across that whole time period. With the possible exception of this clump of the most recent observations in 2021, where there seems to be a systematic change in the delay. But actually, since all of these are plotted relative to one specific tile, the black triangles across the zero delay here, uh, it's far more likely that, of course, that just that one tile was doing something funky during that time period, while all the others still stayed relatively constant. On the whole, though, it looks like the phase offsets are indeed very stable in time. But even then, we can't necessarily say that the Gleam phase correction is a panacea for all polarization leakage problems because it still depends on how the phase error is getting into the calibration solutions in the first place. If, for example, the extra phase is there because of inaccuracies in the B model, then yeah, sure, anyone using the same B model will probably find the same error in their calibration solutions and can apply the Gleam solution. But could it just be, could it? actually just be the beam model. For the Gleam data, which only uses Meridian pointings, I think, you might be able to imagine a scenario where the beam is systematically wrong in, across all of their observations. But actually, in the smart observations I showed in the previous slide, they all use different calibrator fields for different observations at different times, different zenith pointings uh, and azimuths. So it seems that if the problem is in the beam model, then either it doesn't depend on where you point the primary beam, which seems strange to me, or this is evidence that maybe the phase error is not actually due to the beam model. I should say at this point that a lot of work has gone into characterizing the polar, polar, polarimetric response of the MWA primary beam um, by Emil Lentz, uh, Jack Lyon, Atul Chokshi, Adrian, uh, Sutinjo, just to name a few. Work before the FEE beam model became available in 2016 obviously could not compare the results with the FEE beam. Um, and I believe there are several researchers who are actively working on getting uh, getting this to a better sense of how the how correct the FEE beam is, particularly with regards to polarization. Okay, well, what about the sky model then? Now, the possibility that the error is in the sky model is an interesting one. For a long time, I was under the misconception that you couldn't expect to get the phase difference correct between a north-south and east-west east-west dipoles if your sky model only consists of Stokes I sources. But that turns out to be generally untrue for the MWA. 
One explanation I've heard floating around is that the primary beam itself induces a kind of pseudo polarization on the sky so that even unpolarized sources uh, look polarized, uh, except in certain situations, such as when the source is at zenith. The explanation given in the uh, FHD paper is this. So this is a, also a nice one. It says, although it is sometimes asserted that this phase can only be constrained by calibrating to a polarized source, in the wide field, the, the non-orthogonality of the instrumental polarization basis couples appreciable unpolarized source power into the cross-polarization visibilities. So if you still remain unconvinced of this, come and talk to me later, and I'll give you my own take on it. Anyway, the long and the short of it is that if the fact that this, the models are Stokes I models cannot explain the phase error we're seeing, then it seems really hard to imagine any other way to get a systematic time-stable phase error from an incorrect sky model. If anyone knows of one, I'd be very interested to hear it. And finally, if the error is in the calibration software, then again, it seems likely that the same solution would work for anyone using the same software, which in the case of the Gleam team uh, happens to be Andre's Calibrate. Now, a point against, against this being where the error is, is the fact that, I, as I previously mentioned, the leakage, um, similar leakage is found at similar levels in data using other calibration software, um, in particular, the RTS uh, and Hyperdrive. I, I don't know of how FHD performs. Uh, what hasn't been actually verified by anyone, as far as I'm aware, is whether or not the different calibration software produces the same or different amounts of phase errors. It will also be interesting, I think, to compare the results with the FHD pipeline developed by and for the EOR group uh, based in the US. The reason is that the underlying calibration algorithm is different to what's used in the RTS, Calibrate, and Hyperdrive. Although all of the algorithms should, by design, converge on the correct phase offset between the north, south, and east, west dipoles, FHD implements this last phase step um, as a separate distinct operation, which it does only after the uh, north, south dipoles have been separately independently calibrated and the east, west dipoles have been separately independently calibrated. So if it turns out that the calibration solutions produced by FHD don't exhibit this kind of frequency dependent leakage that we've been discussing, then that would warrant definitely a deeper comparison of the algorithms and a very close look at the implementations. So now we seem to be in a bit of a weird situation. By all accounts, the phase error embedded in our calibration solutions, which again, seems to be stable in time and have a frequency dependence, finds no easy explanation in terms of either the B model, the sky model, or the calibration software. And of course, it makes no sense to blame the data or to talk about signal path delays or something embedded in the MWA backend. Like I said before, the whole point of these calibration schemes is to find and correct these kinds of errors. If the calibration fails to account for this phase error, then it's uh, tautological to say that it must be the calibration pipeline itself that is at fault. Without knowing where the error is coming from, it's impossible to say whether or not the Gleam correction can be applied to other calibration solutions that were processed in a different way. Of course, what we can say is that, the, is that Gleam has demonstrated how someone might measure the phase correction using their own data and their own pipelines. So I guess you could say that the problem is solved, but I, I would say not really in a practical way that is easy for other groups to verify and adapt. Doing so is, I'd say, of paramount importance to all MWA users who are interested in having confidence that their polarization measurements are correct. So to me, there seems to be two routes we could go down. Route number one is to say, okay, we know there's a problem with the calibration solutions, but we don't really care how it got there because we know how to quantify it and correct for it, thanks to the Glean team's heroic efforts. But to me, this feels essentially like doing calibration twice once using established but buggy pipelines, and then once again by hand. So I'm not really a fan of this route, but it will become the default option unless we actually invest the time to find out where this phase error is coming from and solving it in the calibration pipelines themselves. The trouble is, of course, that no one individual or group is actually tasked to do this. And of course, nobody has time. And even though, uh, giving a talk like this is basically shouting, pick me, pick me. 
I also really don't have time as my current contract is finishing up in a couple of months. And then I'll be working with Natasha on ultra long period sources using data to which this phase correction has already been applied. So there goes my motivation. <laughs> uh, but anyway, these are the two options I, in my view. So my question to the collaboration is, what shall it be? Thank you, that's it. Thank you, Sammy, that was wonderful. Do we have any questions? Can I ask one? I don't know if you saw my raised hand. This is Ramesh. Uh, yes. Um, thanks, Sammy. Um, um, more than a question, more like a comment. It's a very, very interesting uh, and a clear presentation with a lot of information. Um, you mentioned uh, multiple different ways to converge on this, but as you probably know that uh, from time to time, I have also been like uh, putting this one extra bit on the table, and um, which is also came up yesterday in uh, a, quite a few Shai's presentation. And as you remember, some of them were trying to understand the circular polarized emission uh, at uh, MWA, so low frequencies or other frequencies by comparing uh, uh, data taken. I mean, their preference was to get simultaneous data for solar fares from MWA and GMRT. But one thing that uh, is, what's uh, my understanding, I could be wrong, but uh, the issue that you mentioned about uh, the primary beam inducing uh, that polarization issue is something that uh, might be there for different algorithms for the MWA pipeline, but may not be necessarily a big issue in a similar way for dish antennas like uh, GMRT antennas. Except that we all know that at the low frequencies uh, that uh, those antennas are also not very well characterized for uh, uh, polarimetry. But having said that, as I mentioned in a couple of times, and we have a quite a lot of pulsar data taken in the uh, overlapping band with the MWA as part of Ming Yao's project, quite a handful of more than a dozen pulsars. So there is like a one more pathway to consider there uh, as a path to convergence, you know, that I'm just saying that there could be like a valuable uh, um, source of stuff there, you know, I'm just mentioning it. I don't, uh, we have yeah, uh, I will comment on the, the possibility of um, of so I was hoping to have time to talk more about how you could use pulsars, for instance, in in getting better calibration solutions. Um, uh, so just to be super clear, the my belief at the moment is that it doesn't actually matter whether you're including polarized sources in your calibration solution or not. Um, the pipeline itself. Uh, so my prediction is that even if you used polarization sources in the and put it somehow encoded them into the uh, uh, into the inputs of our calibration pipelines, you would still get the wrong answer. Um, because what I said, which is that, that there's there's at least for the MWA, there's no difference between having a truly polarized source and having a pseudo polarized source uh, that's where the, the where it only looks polarized because of the beam. So I suspect that even if you took one of like Gleam's favorite source and put that into the uh, into the calibration, into the inputs, into your sky model, that's what I want to say, um, and then just put that through the calibration software, it would still give you the wrong answer and you'd still have to do a manual correction. This manual correction, I, I instinctively feel is a problem unique to our pipeline. I don't know, um, I, I suspect that other Telescopes, when they say that their color, their polarization calibration is still uh, poorly understood, it's probably because indeed they have a known um, or their their B model or something is is known to be inadequate. But for us, the the the, uh, the symptom that we're seeing is, uh, I think someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but the symptom is worse than we expect it to be because of the level of uh, confidence that we have in the FEE beam. So, so um, can we use pulsars? Um, we, as far as the MWA is concerned, even if we could use pulsars as an input to the calibration pipelines, I don't think it will help this problem. Um, I am interested in, um, in knowing how you might use it in, in a, a fix it in post kind of way. 
um, and I've written up um, a document uh, which I can provide to anyone, um, which is uh, how you might do that for pulsars, kind of adapting the, the Gleam solution uh, to pulsars. Um, but that's that's just a fix it in post kind of kind of solution. Does that make sense, Ramesh? Yeah, 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 I agree. I mean, I was, um, I mean, in the end, we need the solution, but uh, I was uh, basically suggesting this as like a way to cross check what we will convert from a multiple different ways that you mentioned. Because yeah, at some I mean, point definitely, have... yeah, definitely uh, anyone who, uh, whether they, whether we manage to find this problem, find the bug and fix it, or, or whether we do it in some other way, of course, yeah, we, we should be checking that the polarization looks sensible and pulsars are a great way to do that anyway. Thank you, Sami. Nicole, do you want to unmute yourself and ask? Uh, yeah, uh, great talk, Sami. Um, I have a comment and like a bit of a question, I guess. Um, so Aman, who you mentioned, is uh, uh, looking at how getting the B model wrong can affect um, basically your polarization angle. And um, some of the stuff that he was finding um, was that if you if you have like say one dipole has a less of a response than another dipole, you can get this polarization offset. And so he was trying to do some using um, orbcom to try to constrain this phase essentially. But the issue is that it seems to be varying <laughs> across the instrument. Um, but I can imagine you can get some sort of like statistically speaking one dipole having less amplitude, less response than another dipole is saying like the LNA is on top of uh, the X LNA is on top of the Y LNA or something like that. And then the dirt makes that particular dipole, statistically speaking, die sooner than the other dipole. So you can kind of get like a stable phase difference from the dipoles across the array. However, um, I don't know what kind of like time periods you're looking at. I know you fleshed it up real fast in terms of like this um, this overall offset that you're seeing. Is it like over year time spans? Yeah, or yeah, over years. Yeah. Is it over the across of the um, 2020? Okay. Uh, it, well, if you include Gleam's claim that it goes back to 2018, then and this 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 data set goes up to 2021, so that's three years at least. Yeah. Okay. Well, since, at least since, oh God, what was it, 2016? Maybe it was 2018. We started putting the black tar stuff on top of the LNAs so that like the dirt wouldn't preferentially destroy one of the LNAs sooner than the other one. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe, maybe that effect wouldn't be as prominent in this data set. It would be interesting to look even further back in time. And yeah, see if yeah, that's the difference between like phase one, phase two. Yeah, I can say that at least for hyperdrive, um, the uh, any dipole that's flagged as dead in the metadata um, is actually the beams are created, um, uh, the beams are modeled using that information. Um, so uh, that I know in the existing metadata, they're currently binary. So they, you know, they, they right. either they call this dead yes. or not. So you yeah. couldn't, you couldn't, um, you couldn't model at the moment, um, partially working the polarization. Right. Uh, so that is interesting. Um, but uh, at least to that first order of dipoles just being dead or not, um, this effect is still seen. Sure, I can definitely see a spectrum of death being a problem, but yeah. Thanks. Yep. Right, one quick question by Natasha and Sami, there are some questions and comments in the chat if you want to go back to it later. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Sami. That was a super talk. Um, a very, very quick clarification. Um, this was largely a Gleam X uh, correction in Gleam. We had no idea and uh, Chris kind of slaved <laughs> to, to make sure that POGS was uh, was well calibrated. Um, and uh, kind of a fun, moderate digression is that the reason, I'm oh, sorry, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry, thought someone was gonna interrupt. Um, uh, 
it is the reason that we even figured this out um, was because of the very um, polarized transient, um, which was like 40 Janskis, and so actually gave us enough signal to noise to really pin this down. Um, and of course, we also really scientifically driven to understand what it was. Anyway, um, those are sort of minor clarifications. The question I had was, um, there had been some discussion around using uh, the diffuse polarized sky. You know, we saw some pictures from Dev yesterday um, to do this calibration. And of course, that only works if you've got short baselines in your array, but there are some overlaps between the, the um, the compact and long baseline configs. So just wondered if this was, if you talked to any of the diffuse poll people and uh, what you thought about that idea. Yeah, well, um, uh, Dev was showing me their, um, their maps, obviously before today, before yesterday. Um, and, uh, and you can see at a glance that there's leakage between um, Stokes U and Stokes B in, in their maps. Um, and so that's the only, my conversations with Dev are the only conversations that I've spoken to anybody about the possibility of using diffuse polarization um and absolutely but i think it still falls in the same category like my prediction is that uh it just uh that it still counts as a fix it in post kind of solution um uh so yeah we we you can definitely use those maps to diagnose the error and possibly even um find the correction for it um uh but uh my instinct is that, uh, again, we can't, we wouldn't be able to use them as, as, as an input to calibration soft, software pipeline as we have it at the moment to fix the problem. Yeah, sure. Cool. Thanks. Yep. Amazing. Thank you so much, Sami. Yep. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Somehow. Right. So for the next speaker, we have Steve Prabhu giving us a talk about a near field treatment of aperture synthesis techniques using MWA. Steve, do you want to share your screen? Yeah, can you see my... Yeah. Uh, I will be giving you a two minute warning <coughs> and uh, people can pick their hands up in the chat for asking questions. Uh, whenever you're ready, Steve. <coughs> Cool. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Steve Prabhu. I just recently finished my PhD and I currently work as a postdoc uh, at Curtin University with Stephen Tingay. Uh, today I'll be talking on the topic of a near field treatment of aperture synthesis uh, using the MWA. Uh, so in standard aperture synthesis uh, interferometry, we assume the source of interest to be in the far field of the instrument. Hence the instrument perceives a planar wavefront, uh, wavefront based on which we calculate delays and then we, de uh, we derive a Fourier relationship between the visibilities measured in the aperture plane and the sky brightness distribution. However, when you use these techniques to uh, observe events that are in the near field of the instrument, such as uh, satellites, meteors, or um, anything of that distance, um, you, 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 you induce a decorrelation in the reconstructed image because these events are in the near field of the instrument and the instrument perceives a curved wavefront, which we actually don't account for. And uh, this results in like reduction in signal to noise and um, not so accurate reconstruction of the source while imaging. So today I'll be talking about uh, how to do this uh, primarily using the MWA in the context of space surveillance. Uh, cool. So in this slide, I'm showing what we aim to do uh, with the MWA using images I found in the Google. So in all of these images, you can see that the uh, camera focuses on very clearly onto um, things that are very close to the instrument, uh, such as the flowers in the bottom right uh, image over here. And the background far field um, signals are like blurred out and be focused. So in, 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 in any radio telescope, the opposite is true by default. So by default, you're focused uh, to observe something that's far off and anything that's nearby appears defocused, but we want to try and do the opposite. Uh, so I'm gonna show the results up front. Uh, so it is possible to change the focal distance of the array. Uh, so uh, when I say change the focal distance, I do not mean um, I'm not talking about uh, adding in delays at the correlator during the correlation phase, but rather um, in the software uh, data reduction phase, where pretty much like how you can change the phase center of an observation post the observation is done, you can move your fringes around and change the focal distance of the array, which is what I'll be talking about today. 
so in these two animations over here, I'm showing um, two observations, one from phase one MWA, one from phase three MWA. Uh, and in both cases, I'm changing the focal distance from a very, very far away point. So I, I, I assume 10,000 kilometers to be uh, far enough that it can be assumed to be far field. Uh, and, and then I uh, bring the focal distance uh, much closer. And when the focal distance is around 500 kilometers, we start seeing the International Space Station here in the phase three image. Uh, and uh, in the phase one image, there is a very faint enhancement in the signal to noise of the ISS signal um, when the focal distance is correct. Uh, yeah, so just based on these two uh, images, we can make three observations. Uh, one being in the phase three um, uh, animation, uh, the, the light from the International Space Station goes through a drastic change uh, as opposed to the light from uh, phase one array. So in phase three, from the ISS signal not being visible at all, uh, it starts appearing when you have a reasonably approximate the approximately correct focal distance and then as you bring the focal distance even closer it washes and decorrelates away uh, but in the phase one animation uh, even with far field delays you can pretty much see uh, the ISS signal and then you have a small signal to noise boost um, and one other point to note is that in the phase one observation over here you can faintly see uh, the Vela supernova remnant over here um, so as I change the focal distance the phase structure of Vela is not lost, so it's not it doesn't get distorted as much. But uh, in the phase three observation, the point source that you have over here uh, gets totally decorrelated as you change the focal uh, distance. So that's one other observation to be made. And the third being the light from the International Station uh, Space Station over here, the phase three array uh, changes significantly. And is there something that we can learn from uh, the light versus focal distance plot? So I'll bring this pl uh, plot, not plot, slide back again at the end of my talk, and hopefully we've discussed enough uh, aperture synthesis uh, to be able to explain these three observations. Uh, before I go on to near field aperture synthesis, I'll give a brief introduction to uh, space surveillance because I'm using space uh, surveillance uh, as the um, test case to demonstrate this capability. Uh, so uh, basically, we kind of use the MWA as a passive radar to try and detect uh, satellites. So uh, you have lots of active uh, FM transmitters that are actively transmitting. The signal can go up um, into low Earth orbits, reflect off satellites, fall back onto the MWA, and you can kind of see these uh, satellites using the MWA as a, a passive radar. Uh, and uh, we use the standard correlated mode, uh, although there are parallel methods uh, developed by Brendan using the voltage capture mode, uh, I'll be talking mostly using the standard correlated mode uh, space surveillance capability. So we use difference imaging. Um, so uh, how? So in this in this context, I'm showing frequency differencing. You can also do time differencing. Uh, so in frequency differencing is where you pick one fine channel that has your uh, International Space Station FM reflection, uh, and then you pick another fine channel that is not so far off, uh, preferably within the same post channel, uh, and then you subtract the two and then you're left behind with uh, just the, um, the, near, the satellite signal. Uh, so the reason this works reasonably well is because the two fine channels are not far, far apart that the uh, instrument starts behaving chromatically, so you start seeing imaging PSF uh, artifacts. Um, so it's not that far off, and because they're also reasonably close, the sky uh, between the two channels can be assumed to be flat spectrum, and then you can reasonably well, uh, reasonably remove the background source. And uh, yeah, you can also plot the dynamic spectrum of the satellite signals. So over here, I show the dynamic spectrum of the International Space Station. Uh, in x-axis, you have frequency. Y-axis, you have time. You can see the different FM channels reflected by the ISs. Uh, and if you were to pick one of these fine channels that had the signal, uh, you can actually uh, see these satellite signals uh, without cleaning, uh, way about the confusion noise. So in this animation over here, you can see the International Space Station going past the Vela supernova remnant. Uh, over here, you see a satellite called Alavit. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's an object that's meter in diameter, 2,000 kilometers away, and it's... Um, uh, it's going past this point source over here is Fonax A. So the reason it appears as a Fon uh, as a Fonax A appears as a point source is because of 
just use the short base lines to do this Im to this to, to do this uh, imaging. Uh, so yeah, even with phone axe in the field of view without deconvolution, you can see these satellite signals above confusion noise, and of course you can also see Starlink. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and Starlink is no longer the biggest problem. There are bigger satellites uh, that are much bigger than Starlink uh, coming yeah, out there. Cool. Going back to near field um, aperture synthesis. So in this diagram, I try and show uh, the near field problem. Uh, so I've considered two different MWA tiles here together constituting a baseline. Uh, you have the uh, sky plane over here, LM, and this uh, can be a used as the aperture plane, UV plane. And if the source is at the far field, you have a planar wavefront falling onto the array and hence you can derive delays or the W term for each baseline. Uh, but because the signal of interest is in the near field of the instrument, you in fact have a curved wavefront instead of a planar wavefront. And there is this phi offset between the planar wavefront and the curved wavefront, which is not corrected for uh, using standard reduction methods. Uh, and hence, this is the this this is the factor that uh, in, introduces decorrelation in the reconstructed image. Uh, however, because we if if we know how far away the near field event is, we can calculate this curvature for every single baseline. And using the same math as how you would change the phase center post observation, uh, you can add in the extra delay uh, to your uh, W term of the visibility so that it gets gridded in a different W layer while imaging. Uh, and this would also result in um, rotating your fringes in the sky by a certain amount. So that's done by this uh, phase uh, correction term over here for every single uh, visibility. And we test this method using uh, phase two observation of the International Space Station. Uh, so over here uh, in the top left uh, image, I've taken the short baselines so I think I used 800 meters as the cutoff uh, to create this uh, image of the International Space Station. You can really fairly well see the International Space Station. And in the long baseline image, uh, you don't see uh, the International Space Station with far field delays. And one other point to note is that the reason it appears as a streak is because uh, I've used time differencing here instead of frequency differencing. Uh, but it, but otherwise, it shouldn't impact the results in any other way other than how the signal looks like um, going between frequency differencing and time differencing. Uh, and, and once we apply this correction, this near field correction, because we know the International Space Station is around 400 kilometers away, uh, so you calculate the curvature perceived by every single baseline, apply the correction, and you, uh, you have an enhancement in signal to noise in the short baseline image. And you start seeing a streak-like structure uh, in the long baseline image. Uh, so the near field correction uh, has worked uh, and, and, and is capable of bringing the focal distance to a much closer point post-observation. So how does this look uh, in the um, aperture and sky plane, which we know to share a Fourier relationship? So in the aperture plane, in this animation over here, I'm, I'm showing uh, real visibilities from one of the uh, MWA observations and I'm changing the focal distance again from a very far away point bringing it much closer uh, to a desired near field point and as I'm doing the correction um, you can see that the longer baselines uh, go through more and more correction because they start seeing uh, more and more curvature and the short baselines for most of the focal distances don't undergo much correction uh, because uh, they would still perceive the source to be in the far field uh, for a good amount of focal distances, uh, the short baselines. And this in the sky plane uh, would appear as rotating the fringes at different rates. So I've arbitrarily taken one long baseline to demonstrate over here and one short baseline. And in the bottom left plot, you can see the delay correction applied to this particular long baseline. And the uh, in the middle bottom panel, you can see the delay correction done to the short baseline. So you can see that as you're bringing the focal distance closer and closer, the long baseline starts seeing more and more curvature. So it goes through larger delay and delay rate corrections. But the short baselines, the majority of the distances doesn't perceive much curvature, so there isn't much correction to be done. And in the top right panel, you can see a combined effect of the two baselines. Uh, and MWA has, uh, for a single snapshot of the sky, it has around 8,000 instantaneous baselines. So you have around 8,000 baselines moving at different directions at different 
rates and delay rates and together they uh, they achieve coherence on the near field source as you can see in the bottom right image so when the focal distance is correct all your fringes are at the right place um, and you start seeing the near field source uh, in order to validate that we don't have a systematic uh, in our pipeline or are, we haven't assumed something which we are not supposed to be assuming I do a null test so this is where I pick uh, frequency difference visibilities uh, from the FM channel so uh, because it's frequency difference you only have the International Space Station and uh, the background sky is not there in the visibilities in anymore and similarly I pick another set of frequency difference visibilities outside the FM channel and this so this technically should just have thermal noise because uh, there is no uh, FM reflection in it because it, it's outside the FM band and the sky also has been subtracted out so it just has to be thermal noise and uh, in the middle panels I show the face of the visibilities uh, plotted against UV distance and you can see that as I'm up changing the focal length uh, when the focal length is uh, around 500 kilometers uh, for the ISS frequency difference visibilities you start achieving coherence because the source is at the face center most of the visibilities uh, start cluttering towards uh, 0 and 180 phase um, but uh, in the bottom panel because it's just thermal noise uh, which have random faces you are doing a very systematic face correction as you're changing the focal length which again should result as a random distribution of faces and you end up achieving no co coherence in the reconstructed image so our method works and there is uh, we don't have some sort of a dc offset or something that's affecting that brings up a source at the face center uh, yeah cool uh, so we managed to change the focal length to a desired near field point but uh, when, in order to do this exercise, we used the knowledge of how far the International Space Station is, but can you do the inverse where you have a near field event whose distance you do not know, but rather using the curvature perceived by the array, uh, you uh, try and infer a range to the source by trying to autofocus onto the uh, event. So this is where you trial different focal distances and whatever gives you the maximum coherence on the reconstructed source would tell you the distance. Uh, to the source, so something like autofocusing with the MWA. So this is possible to do with the MWA. Uh, so this is what I'm showing here in this animation. Uh, so in the top left panel, two minutes. Oh, okay. So in the top left panel, you can see that I'm face tracking uh, the International Space Station, and as I'm face tracking, I'm trying trialing different uh, focal distances, and I'm plotting corresponding signal to noise. And you can see that it peaks at the um, the decoherence plot uh, peaks at the correct focal distance and hence you can track the range of the object and you can track it in 3D. Uh, I'm going to quickly go past. Uh, and one important point to note is that, uh, so I'm, I'm sorry I'm going quite fast, if you have any questions you can follow up with me later. Uh, the range resolution, so the capability be, to be able to infer the range comes from the uh, rate of change of curvature perceived by the array as you change the focal distance. So because as you, uh, and hence as you take the focal point further and further away, the change in curvature perceived by the array reduces and hence your range resolution drops and you start getting large error bars. <clears throat> and one important point uh, is that uh, in, this, in, the, in the right plot what I show is the noise in the residual image. So what I've done here is I've uh, made a sequence of images from uh, uh, focused at different focal lengths. Uh, and I used WS Clean to do the same number of it, uh, clean iterations and I'm plotting the noise of the residual map. So in a perfect residual map, you would have removed all the sources, removed all the confusion noise and you should just have thermal noise and ideally you would expect it to be flat at all focal distances but we can see that you reach the minimum noise only when uh, the assumed focal distance is equal to the near field's uh, RFI in your uh, in your image. So the reason this is important is because if you have a near field RFI in your image and you, if you try to peel it off by cleaning on it, you would never perfectly clean because your fringes are in the wrong place and you would always leave behind confusion noise in your image. So the only perfect way to remove your near field RFI from the, from the observation is to face up your visibilities to the near field point, uh, peel the source and then after you've subtracted it from your visibilities, you uh, face back the visibilities to infinity. Uh, that's the only way you can perfectly remove your near field RFI. Uh, yeah.
and we are able to model this as well. So Stevens modeled this decorrelation signature that we see. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's a multi-dimensional search. It's uh, computationally expensive, but we are able to reproduce the decorrelation signature that we see. Uh, and uh, yeah, these are some other new field examples where the technique can be applied. So in conclusion, um, earlier on in one of my earlier slides, we made three observations of these two uh, uh, animations. So one, we can note that the light from the ISS in the phase three array goes through more change in light. So the reason being phase three has predominantly longer baselines than phase one array. Uh, and hence there is more um, near field curvature to be corrected for and hence um, it goes the light from the ISS in phase 3 observation goes through a drastic change in contrast uh, and second observation being Vela over here in phase 1 observation doesn't get distorted while the point source here gets distorted as we do the near field correction reason being uh, Vela is an extended source so most of its information is stored in the short baselines uh, which don't undergo much near field correction because for a wide range of focal distances they still see the source in far field so the structure of VLA is preserved but the point source over here for your transform of it is flat on the UV plane so as you do the near field correction it gets distorted and the light from the ISS uh, you can infer the range from the light uh, how the light changes with focal length, uh, distance so basically you're fitting a uh, radius to the curvature perceived by the instrument uh, and you hence in further range. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Steve. I can see a very quick hand by Natasha. Go ahead. Thanks, Steve. That was so cool. Um, I just had a very quick question kind of to follow up your point about you can never remove RFI. So the radio horizon uh, for like if you're just looking east west or you know on the ground, the radio horizon is about five kilometers. So I guess, you know, could you use this technique to figure out where ground-based RFI is, or is it always reflected over from the ionosphere, uh, and so you wouldn't be able to get a sensible signal? Uh, as in, you mean tra transmitters near the horizon? Yeah. Uh, I think ideally you should be able to, uh, but I haven't tried, so it's just a naive, naive comment. But I think yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Natasha. Are there any more questions for Steve? Going once, going twice, right? You're off the hook, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Uh, for our next talk, we have Danny Price telling us about a commensal NW beam former for SETI and FRBs. Danny, do you want to share your slide? Sure. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay. And you can see the slides. Yes, amazing. Take it away, Danny. Great. Okay. Uh, well, good morning or afternoon or evening, everyone, depending on where you are. Uh, today, I'll be talking about uh, finding FIBs and uh, techno signatures with the MWA. Uh, the image I've got here is actually generated by an AI called Midjourney, and it is a uh, Neil in a cosmic haystack. So. Without further ado, if my slides will advance. Okay, well, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or SETI, uh, kicked off in the 1960s when Frank Drake uh, turned the Tatal Telescope to the sky and started looking at uh, two sun-like stars uh, to see if there was any evidence of transmissions coming from them. And while he didn't find anything, he did launch the, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, which has captured people's hearts and imaginations uh, over the last uh, several decades. To look at uh, what he used, and I won't go into this in too much detail, but his system was pretty simple. It was basically uh, at the start of the digital revolution. So a lot of stuff here is actually analog and not digital. Uh, his bandwidth was a few hertz as opposed to the uh, you know many gigahertz of bandwidth that uh, systems can produce now and just putting it into perspective in the 60s uh, one of the the biggest supercomputers in the world was ibm stretch which could do about a million instructions a second 
Uh, now when Satonix comes online, it should be able to do uh, 50 petaflops or so, um, which is you know, much larger. If you were using the matrix cores, you could probably get up to 100 as well. So we're looking at something like a 10 billion times improvement. This is just uh, Moore's laws. Um, you know, some of the scaling laws have broken down, um, but the technology continues to increase and uh, double every 18 months to 24 months. And because of that exponential increase, we just have much, much more powerful computers than we used to. So our technological capabilities are far better. <clears throat> um, uh, SETI was starved from funding from the 1990s or so. And so uh, the, the technological possibilities were not realized in the, the last few decades following. Uh, another major change in the 90s, of course, is our understanding of astrobiology and what we see here, and I'll start it playing, you may hear some uh, soothing music as well if it comes through, is a uh, orrery, which is a, a look, I'll just start it playing as we go. Um, each thing you see here moving is a planet detected with the Kepler telescope. We now know that exoplanets are ubiquitous and Earth-like exoplanets are far more common than was previously thought. The, the color of these dots indicates the probable temperature on the surface based on luminosity arguments from the host star and the uh, size of the potential size of the planet. Um, the larger planets are easier to detect than smaller planets for obvious reasons. And so with this backdrop, with uh, just the technological capabilities and our understanding of astrobiology, uh, it was time for a new search, a new study search to start. And this is where Breakthrough Listen comes in. And to, to say very quickly, uh, one thing that my colleague liked to say was that it's the Apollo program of SETI. It was launched in 2015, and it's a 10-year, $100 million program likely to be extended uh, while we continue to do other research. Um, and the people you see in the photo here on the left is uh, the main sponsor, Yuri Milner, who's a Silicon Valley uh, philanthropist and uh, the advisory board back in 2015, uh, which, you know, Stephen Hawking's and Frank Drake, both of which have sadly passed on, uh, then Sir Lord Martin Rees and uh, Anne Druyan, who uh, was the director of Cosmos. Now, in its first few years, uh, Breakthrough was using single dish telescopes because that's kind of the, the bread and butter that uh, SETI always used to do. And uh, traditionally, SETI just piggybacked and looked wherever the main observer was looking. Uh, Breakthrough Listen was one of the first ones where uh, telescope time was actually purchased so that we could look and do a, uh, you know, uh, scientifically rigorous and comprehensive survey of, of nearby stars because nearby stars are generally not that interesting uh, in the radio unless they're a flare star. So they're not uh, primary targets for most telescopes. Uh, we were using uh, Parks Mariang and the Green Bank Telescope were the, the big two main ones we used. And then we also had an optical telescope called the Automated Planet Finder, which I'm not going to mention too much here. Uh, just last week, we announced Breakthrough Listen on Meerkat. And the idea is uh, with the Meerkat Telescope, in two years, we'll be able to search one million stars commensally. And this, this is a piggyback program where we're just looking wherever the primary observer is. And this is uh, enabled by Ethernet Multicast, so we can actually get an exact copy of the data that's sent to the, the main correlator. Uh, so interferometric SETI has a lot of advantages, but it is a lot harder, and so it needs a lot more compute power. And uh, Breakthrough Listen um, fortunately had the funding um, and the wherewithal to actually make uh, this happen. And there's a, a giant cluster uh, comparable in size to the correlator that's been installed specifically for, for SETI application. Uh, the SETI Institute, which is uh, separate to Breakthrough Listen, but obviously we work closely together, uh, also realized that interferometers are the future. And not to be done by Breakthrough Listen, they launched a program on the VLA. And this upgrade called COSMIC uh, converts the telescope from a custom signal transport to commodity Ethernet, so we can use multicast, which would be amazing for SETI, but also for other backends, notably fast radio bursts. And I should say here that I haven't mentioned fast radio bursts much yet. Um, I think there's a, a enough um, understanding of, of people in the audience of what fast radio bursts are that I won't say too much, but it is also another thing that we want to do with the, the, the commercial backend. And you'll hear more about FRBs, no doubt, this afternoon and uh, after this talk. 
So since launching in, in 2015, uh, Brick Edison has made it a point of partnering with as many other telescopes around the world to help grow SETI capability. Um, we don't have enough members on the team to, to make all of these happen by ourselves. The idea is that we uh, provide a, a expertise and some technology uh, to help uh, bring SETI capability around. So all these telescopes you see here now have uh, SETI programs uh, either underway or planned. Um, including something like the VLT and the Vera Rubin Observatory, which I'm uh, particularly excited about. Uh, before briefly listening, this map would only have had a few points on it. And uh, what I'm really trying to say here, and uh, my point is that we're, you know, taking over. And at the risk of showing my age with this ancient meme, uh, all your telescopes belong to us. Uh, if you're a Gen Z who isn't familiar with this meme, I strongly suggest Googling all your base as it to round out your, your meme education, because it's very important to know. To kind of summarize that, um, and I, I don't want to say how amazing a break to listen is, that wasn't the point. My point is that, you know, firstly, we're in this uh, golden age of astrobiology, and we're also in a golden age of, you know, technological uh, improvements, which has just been going since the 60s. And we are entering, I think, a golden age for techno signature searches. And there's still a huge amount of low hanging fruit, um, particularly at low frequencies, which is where the MWA would come in. Uh, SETI has been leading technical developments as well, um, as opposed to just piggybacking. And it means that new science observing modes can now piggyback on SETI science and vice versa. It's about getting the most out of all the telescopes that you can um, scientifically and you know, uh, making sure that you work together toward common goals. Of course, uh, there was SETI done on the MWA before Breakthrough Listen was even uh, conceived. Uh, back in 2013, uh, Stephen Tingay led a paper uh, looking at a SETI program toward the Galactic Center where they just used uh, existing data. It was kind of an um, opportunistic uh, search uh, using an existing data cube with um, tone exoplanets in it. And uh, this kind of was repeated uh, through different variations each time, improving. Um, and, and on different fields with, with MWA existing data cubes. Um, so this is kind of what I'm talking about, low hanging fruit. Um, the, these papers were, uh, you know, set some pretty stringent constraints and were, you know, important papers, but the amount of uh, effort compared to some of the effort you have to go to with, uh, with other science, so I'm looking at EOR, is, um, is much lower for um, the, what you're able to do. And if you do make that ultimate discovery, um, I would say it's, it's more important than EOR as well. Uh, we can argue about that after. Uh, again, I don't think I've got too much time to go into the, the math behind these slides, um, but uh, the what I wanted to show is the kind of current thinking of, of what kind of survey should be done to maximize the chance of success. And really, you want to cover the entire sky. That's kind of obvious. Um, you want to cover all the nearby stars, but you want to cover every star you possibly can. Um, and this is kind of shown on the left axis in this, it's called transmitter rate, and it's a, essentially a combination of frequency coverage and uh, sky coverage. Um, on the bottom is EIRP, which is equivalent isotropic radiated power, and EIRP min is the minimum uh, detectable, which is basically the radiometer equation with a, a slight um, change for narrowband signals in this case. And um, uh, the points on here, where you want to be is the bottom left. So you want to be more sensitive and you want to be more complete. There's also lots of other axes you can consider like periodicity or, um, uh, you know, there was some papers recently on um, gravitational uh, SETI, which are kind of fun, but uh, so there's, you can't distill everything into one kind of plot, but the idea is that you want to be as sensitive as you can and as complete as you can. And so the the work uh, that uh, um, uh, Chinoa Tremblay led back in 20, at the start of 2022, um, put some points on this plot, which were, you know, some of the most constraining just from looking at an existing MWA data set. So you know, almost without breaking a sweat. Uh, on the right is a, another plot from Chinoa's paper showing uh the frequency coverage of SETI surveys to date the size of the bubble is also kind of how complete it is and the color is whether it's looking at stars galaxies or pulsars and you can see the mwa points on the bottom there there's uh, just nothing else um, competing against it and there's so much frequency space that we have not covered um, with SETI searches all right so 
Uh, now on to the actual kind of topic of the talk, uh, which is the commensal SETI and FRB system. And uh, this has been going for a few years, so some of you may have already heard about this. Um, a breakthrough listen compute node was installed um, close to the start of the project in the Curtin data center. And it's just shown here on the top left, uh, one of the drives is missing because we were swapping it. Uh, on the bottom, you can see the MWA cache servers as well, um, the ones with the three fans, the 45 drive cases. Uh, so there is a compute node that's installed there with uh, GPUs and um, uh, tens of terabytes of storage, but I think it's uh, 45 terabytes per partition there. So a lot of disks. And the fun thing is that there's a 100 gigabit a second link between the MWA site and Curtin. And through the power of Ethernet multicast, which is this technology that allows you to uh, basically like an email exploder, you can subscribe to a data stream and get it. And uh, instead of having to uh, set an IP endpoint, you just tell your uh, FPGAs and your receivers to send all your data to to the switch to a, a magic number, like an email exploder, and then um, anyone can subscribe to it. So through that, uh, the MWAX correlator can get the data, and also we can get some of the voltage data. And as long as we don't fully uh, saturate that link, then um, everything works fantastic. And so this is a, a mid-journey AI uh, Ethernet power man. Um, I can't remember exactly what I um, to put in that but uh, a superhero holding up an ethernet switch or something kind of came out a bit strange anyway uh to show a bit of a networking diagram um and this one took a while to draw because uh, uh, it's actually quite uh, complex i think um, there's three different sites uh, but i think it sums it up nicely uh, you can ignore the things dashed in blue here. These are things that uh, we would build if we had a million dollars, which I have applied for from Breakthrough um, um, and is in the budget. So that's uh, fingers crossed that goes through. Uh, but uh, the the point here is that there's this 100 gigabit link between the MWA on the left, um, which I need to update to have the new site name and Curtin University. There's also links to Pawsey um, and you know the CSIRO have a separate link as well. Um, there's loads of un, uh, unlit fiber as well. So there's, there's lots of capability to increase some of these links uh, potentially. And the pipeline itself, I won't go into in too much detail, uh, but it generates uh, high resolution dynamic spectra. And uh, this reuses a lot of code from MWAX. And I should say that a majority of this code is um, from uh, the Morrison Sleep Cross Dream Team. And what the code does essentially is it captures data, which is sent through the network and puts it into a memory buffer. It then gets the metadata that you need and all the observing status. And then it does beamforming, um, does a, currently an incoherent sum. Uh, that's how we've set it up, uh, but it can also do coherent sums as well. And then it does a Fourier transform and detection to form your dynamic spectrum. Finally, it writes to filter bank files. So a uh, the two data products that are produced are a high time resolution product where you've got one millisecond um, uh, data output and a high frequency resolution data product where essentially you have um, not reduced your data rate at all. You have one second and one hertz um, resolution. And uh, you can't do better than that because it's uh, impossible because it takes uh, one second's worth of data to produce a one hertz signal in a um, spectrum. So. At the moment, we're only recording one course channel, but um, we would like to improve that in the future, um, but either by installing more hardware or um, you know, being able to capture more than one channel per compute node. Two minutes, Danny. All right, thanks. Uh, so we have recorded around 2,500 observations. It's uh, running right now, I believe. Uh, at least it was when I checked last night. And the idea is basically once we have these data to do a steady search and an FRB search. Um, and the FRB search uh, is, you know, exciting because it would be able to also detect, you know, giant pulses and things and um, just uh, hasn't been done in real time before. Uh, whereas we will be able to get that up and running in real time. Um, and I don't think we'll have to break much of a sweat to do that because the data volume for at least for one course channel is, is very low in, in an incoherent sum. Uh, on the left, <clears throat> I'm showing a, something that uh, I around last night and uh, just found a, an example candidate signal. So this is a narrow band signal. If you look at the bottom, the, uh, the frequency axis, it goes from uh, you know, 0.885 to 0.8556, you know, so it, it's tiny. 
Uh, and this event um, had this signal to noise of about 18 with the Turbo Steady pipeline. Um, if this was in a 10 kilohertz channel, that would have gone down to about 0.18. It, basically, you wouldn't have been able to detect this signal in a um, 10 kilohertz channel. Uh, if you use coherent beamforming instead of incoherent beamforming, you get um, you know, a square root 128 uh, number of tiles uh, improvement, but you would still not be able to detect this. So these are the kinds of signals that are in your data, uh, sorry to scare you, and you would not be able to see them. Um, so it's very useful in terms of RFI and understanding to, to do these kind of um, steady searches as well, because it will show you some of the scary things that are lying in your data. Okay, uh, I should uh, wrap up there as well. So uh, just to say some future plans, and the main one is to capture more than one channel per compute node. For the FRB search, I think, you know, one channel is not going to be that competitive, but if we could get more, um, then we, we start to get pretty interesting. Um, uh, another thing is uh, processing multiple beams um, and just getting more compute capacity. There is some space uh, in the uh, data center and some space on the link, um, although we you know, need to make sure that we don't saturate it. Um, and, you know, in, as well as SETI, there's a Narabin RFI site survey and a FRB giant pulse search would be fun as well. So I'll finish by saying thank you. Also, thank you to everybody else who's involved, who's uh, shown in the bottom right here. and. Uh, on the topic of giant pulses, here is a giant crab pulse uh, made pulsar made with mid journey. Just uh, pretty amazing that uh, AI can do this kind of thing. Uh, so there you go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danny. That was wonderful. Love the last picture, though. Um, do we have any questions for Danny? Feel free to raise your hands or ask in the chat. I don't see any questions in the chat or no one's hand is raised. So if you have any questions for Danny that pop up, you can ask him in the chat later on. Other than that, thank you so much, Danny. We'll move on to our last speaker before we go for the break. Uh, it's Natasha Hurley Walker telling us about long period radio transients. Natasha, do you want to share your screen? Yeah, it's just connecting. Did it come up? Yep. Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, I'm just waiting for the slides to load. Yeah, sorry everybody for not being uh, uh, there in person. Um, I'm uh, <laughs> I'm recovering from COVID, so it's not ideal. All right. Amazing. There we go. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks, Susanita, and thanks to the organizers for um, highlighting this talk as keynote. That was um, a delightful surprise. At first, I assumed I just hadn't been accepted because I couldn't find myself on the program. Um, but yeah, no, this is a, an exciting topic that's that's come up a few times. Um, and yeah, I was not sure how much I would include in this talk, uh, but I think I'm going to show things that uh, people haven't seen before, uh, especially if you're, you're uh, dialing in from outside of Curtin. Um, so yeah, this is a, a, a bit of a bigger team than um, the, the last time I, I gave a talk on this topic, uh, and you'll see why. Okay, so uh, just a very, very quick reminder that uh, there are lots of very cool radio transients in our universe. Um, I did a, a master's project on pulsars uh, in 2004. Uh, <laughs> and then I, I went to the dark side and, and haven't done anything with transients uh, until the last couple of years. So um, these are, you know, I know about these things. Um, some of you work on these things, but um, don't consider me an expert, despite what I'm going to show you next. Um, the, generally, the, the, the points that I want to bring out here are that um, uh, these are very exciting. They can tell you all sorts of things about high energy physics. Um, but for the most part, they're quite difficult to detect at low frequencies. I think pulsars are probably the exception uh, on this plot. And a lot of the time uh, have flux densities of sort of Milijanskis just outside the range of uh, the MWA. So there's a, there's a great transients group and they've been doing a lot of work, but a lot of the time um, you're, you're finding limits. Um, fortunately, and completely serendipitously, uh, in the GleamX team, where we're obviously doing a large radio sky survey, we happen to detect an entirely new kind of transient. Um, Tyrone Ardurdi, uh, you can see him fourth author on this discovery paper published earlier this year, uh, was doing an honors project with me and Paul, Cat Paul Hancock. 
and we were differencing Gleamex data taken at different epochs. Um, and we're doing this in the galactic plane because by doing that differencing technique, we would remove all of that very annoying and obviously very constant um, emission. So uh, that uh, allowed us to find the source that was changing over the course of a two minute observation and then found that it was repeating every 18 and a bit minutes, which is of course not really predicted by any of those previous classes. Now, uh, we found this is very highly linearly polarized. And as I mentioned at the end of Sammy's talk, it was actually finding the source and making measurements of it across a whole range of different um, beam positions and locations in the sky that made us investigate and finally get our polarization calibration correct because most polarized sources are only um, a sort of a, a tops a Jansky. Uh, and here we were gifted this uh, 20 to 50 Jansky source that we could actually do that calibration on. So that was, that was actually quite handy from a technical point of view as well. The most frustrating thing about this very cool source is that it was only on for three months in early 2018. Uh, and despite some extremely deep imaging with Meerkat, um, looking at it with X-ray telescopes, looking through all sorts of archives, we never ever saw it again, um, which, you know, it's great that the MWA found something, but frustrating from the point of view of, um, uh, you know, trying to understand more about it. And also, you know, demonstrate to the community that it's definitely a real thing and not just somehow something that you can only see with the MWA. Um, FRB people might remember, you know, when when the first, the first FRBs were found in the parks data, and then they found peritons from the microwaves opening and closing. It was very easy to write that off as, you know, a microwave door opening and closing. So it's very frustrating that we could not get a detection of this with any other telescope. Also, one source is really difficult to build any kind of understanding uh, of, of its nature. So we really needed to find more. Um, so to, to paraphrase Jim Condon, you know, there's nothing as useless as a radio source. Well, actually there is a radio transient that was on for a couple of months and has never gone again never there again. Um, but if we had more of these things, maybe we could find some more and then they'd be slightly less useless. So obviously, I don't need to say much about the MWA, but if we found one with the MWA, maybe it's a good instrument to find more. And to channel Ron Eakers here, the key thing about the MWA is the staggeringly large field of view, which is just fantastic if you're trying to find new things. Okay, so we can be a little bit more smart about this with Gleamex. We were just looking at the whole sky. We used our differencing technique on the galactic plane because that's where it would be most effective, not because we were particularly expecting to find anything. But now we found something, we can have a rough guess at where they might be. So the first source was found just off the galactic plane at about minus two and a half degrees um, galactic latitude. So uh, that means that these sources are probably not constrained to just the very, very inner disk of the galaxy, where you might expect uh, very young objects like uh, a, a magnetar um, to, to reside. So instead, perhaps they have some distribution that is more like a pulsar distribution. And so this is a pulsar distribution simulation from this paper. Um, there's some nice code, you can download it, you can make your own simulations. Um, and this is kind of a side view, and this is a top down view. Um, this central deficit, I'm not going to go into it. It's uh, not clear whether this is a real thing or a selection bias. It kind of doesn't matter for our purposes. So you get this some kind of distribution on the sky. Unfortunately, uh, while I would like to say we can just then look and maybe uh, do a sort of R squared, things get fainter, the ISM is in the way. And so our beautiful pulses, which last for 30 to 60 seconds, have two major effects happen to them. One is dispersion, where as a function of frequency squared, um, the pulses get delayed. And of course, we have some bandwidth, so that creates some kind of smearing across the bandwidth. And the other is that the, the pulses get scattered. So they are uh, due to propagation effects. Um, they don't all arrive coherently. And so you end up with uh, this beautiful initial pulse being scattered out, made it broader and uh, sort of fainter um, in its peak flux density. So that's proportional to the frequency to the power of four, which is very painful. So once you've applied those effects, our, uh, we essentially introduce kind of a scattering horizon. Um, the dispersion measure isn't too bad. Actually, for, for DM, you can see basically to the other side of the galaxy. It's fine. But scattering introduces a, a horizon of about mm, six to eight kiloparsecs, depending on where you look. 
So that means that our apparent population um, is in a different place to our presumably true population. Um, and uh, you can try and uh, come up with some nice pointings that cover this. And so this is 10 pointings uh, with the MWA at 200 megahertz. Of course, I want to go to higher frequencies to minimize those um, propagation effects. Um, you might say, why didn't you put more pointings here? Uh, this is the Northern Hemisphere. Cygnus A is about here, and it's already very difficult to use this pointing. So unfortunately, not really a great um, area to look with the MWA. OK, so this year uh, I had a fantastic third year student, Janad Horvath. You might remember his name coming up at the previous project meeting. Um, he came up with uh, some really nice uh, filters and algorithms to look through uh, data and search for transient sources. I won't have time in this talk to go into them, but if that's something that's interesting to you, please do chat to me. Um, and so our, our project team up here, eventually we had this pipeline, which I actually managed to get working uh, as a uh, Escron job on Garawala, uh, where it would pull from ASVO, smash through the automated pipeline and upload to uh, an interface created for us by ADAX. Thank you very much, Nick, um, where we could then, you know, have a look, uh, basically come in in the morning and look at transient candidates. Uh, this worked maybe one time in eight because of Astro issues. The pipeline was fine, but the hardware anyway. Um, so we get this uh, beautiful set of uh, transient candidates to look for. Unfortunately, there's still like ionospheric scintillation, um, uh, even off like the edges of supernova remnants. Uh, so occasionally uh, we saw the ISS. I think I gave that to Steve. You can mention later whether it was useful, Steve. Um, we saw lots of, you know, false candidates, but we did eventually see a real thing. So this was in some monitoring data that the, the 10 pointings that I showed, we were observing those every three days, processing through this pipeline and coming up with candidates. And uh, the 739th candidate was unmistakably something very interesting. So this is what we saw. So the top left is our filter image. Um, so that's just like a detection bit of image processing to, to find um, sources that vary through your, your image. Um, the bottom left is what you would expect from Gleam. And you can see there's some nice sources that are very constant. They're not there. That's good. There's nothing there in Gleam. That's fine. There's a pulsar down here. And initially, we thought maybe this, these were associated somehow. I know that seems like quite a large distance, 15 arc minutes. But single dish surveys often have quite large pointing um, sort of accuracies or you know, low pointing accuracies. And so it was at first conceivable that these were, in fact, the same object. But uh, we later ruled that out. Um, and yeah, you see nothing, 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 nothing. And just towards the last minute of the five minute observation, you get a beautiful peak. Um, we're doing all of this searching in four seconds. So this is kind of low resolution, but I want to show you uh, what we actually saw. That's pretty cool. And that, of course, kicked off. Uh, you mentioned I, I, I went sorry in the chat yesterday when Greg was giving the archive talk. This is why, uh, because not only were we now scanning the entire galaxy every three days, we were also uh, doing pointed follow up with the MWA for a few hours every night that we weren't doing the galactic plane monitoring. Um, so we were constantly trying to get more detections of this source. And here are um, most of our detections um, in 2022A. And uh, they're sort of colored by frequency. There's actually a pink one here, which I'll come back to. And you can see we're redetecting it, which is great. Now, we actually took a lot more observations than are shown here. And that's because the source isn't always on. So if you remember the, um, if you ever saw uh, you know, 1627 or you saw me give talks about it or you read the paper, you'll know that in the paper I said, every time we look for it, when we expected it to be there, it was there. There was no nulling. That's different for this new source, GPM 1839. Um, sometimes you look for it and it's not there, which is very frustrating. You can also see that the um, pulses are really weird. They're very, very, very wide. This is like 200, 400 seconds between these two dashed lines. And sometimes it's a, just a series of nice high signal to noise pulses. And sometimes it's a, a low signal to noise kind of mishmash. Uh, so it's really difficult to work with compared to the original 1627 source. But them's the breaks. It's longer period and it's there right now, which is just the most exciting thing ever. 
So um, this is one of my favorite plots I've ever made with MWA data. Um, this is a 200 megahertz observation, 200 to 231. And you can see one of the pulses arriving and you can see that beautiful dispersion smearing. We actually then changed observing frequency to uh, channel 69, so 72 to 103 megahertz. And we saw the same pulse arrive again, which I just love, like that's the space being incredibly helpful. Um, and so if you line these things up, you actually can get quite a nice handle on the dispersion measure and the scattering. Um, so uh, yeah, Sam McSweeney did uh, that work and thanks very much, Sam, that was very cool. And so we get a, a dispersion measure, which we can plug into electron density models of our galaxy and get out of distance. We can also just see down here that the scattering is quite high. And actually, if you calculate the theoretical scattering through one of these models, it's about 60 seconds. And that's why these beautiful sort of fine scale features that we're seeing at 200 megahertz have kind of been blurred out um, at lower frequencies. There's also in this early version of the plot, some dispersion smearing within each frequency channel. Don't worry, I re-imaged with finer frequency channels. It's just not as pretty a plot. Okay, so it's on. Oh my goodness. And what we knew from the first source was that it was only on for three months. So we had a mad scramble, it's a technical term, to get every telescope that we could pointed uh, at this source uh, as quickly as possible. And that's not fun <laughs> trying to schedule all these different observatories. Um, but I'll, I could talk about that at length. But anyway, we got, at least for Parks and Acker, we had approved time. I made a strong case for Meerkat. Um, ASCAP was in the middle of some kind of maintenance thing. So they actually accepted our DDT request, which was great. And I think Upmost had it, gave it a red hot go, but it's a Meridian telescope. So you only get one shot per day. If the source doesn't show up, it doesn't show up. And we were successful. So this is the combined radio SED across the bandwidth that we were able to observe with those telescopes. Um, this, these sort of measurements here with the MWA are that split pulse that I showed earlier where we see it twice arriving here and then arriving here. And then we have a bit of a problem because uh, not all of these observations were simultaneous and the source brightness changes. As I've just said, it, it can either be quite bright, a little bit bright or off. So how do you put these all in the same SED? Well, for the split pulse, it's easy. For um, There's another set where we had simultaneous observations, where we had an MWA 200 megahertz and a Parks 1.4 gigahertz. Thanks, Danny and uh, Ramesh for the Parks observations. Um, and uh, that meant that we observed those two at the same time, while we observed these two at the same frequency. So I was able to rescale the MWA Parks pair to the MWA MWA pair. Um, ASCAP was taken at another different time again, but I was able to rescale that based on the very top band, which overlaps with the park's low band. And then Meerkat was taken at another time again. Uh, and unfortunately, I didn't have any overlap with anything. So these are just rescaled by eye and you can see they fit pretty well. So this totally arbitrary uh, curved spectrum, uh, those of you at Cairo will be familiar with Nick's um, pulsar spectral fitting code. I did give that a go. It told me, yes, this is the correct fit. Uh, this is not physically parameterized in, it in any way. I have no explanation for this. No one can give me an explanation. No one seems to understand pulsar emission mechanisms well enough to translate what we might know from that into what we would understand here. But this is just the functional form that, that seems to fit the data. Uh, so you can then from this get a radio luminosity. So one of the big complaints in the community from our original observations was that uh, from J1627 was we only had this top part of the band. And of course, that's very difficult to then extrapolate a total radio luminosity. So there's a lot of uncertainty there, especially at higher frequencies. With this data, we can really put those problems to rest. So there's a fun integration you can do over the opening angle, which is frequency dependent, um, and the flux density, which is also frequency dependent, and it involves error functions. And Sam has been absolutely <laughs> a hero in jumping through this horrible mathematics. Anyway, you get a lovely number, uh, about 10 to the 28 ergs per second, which I will come back to. Okay, so that was that's very cool, right? We are already doing a lot with that follow-up. That's great, the source is there, we're finding it fantastic, can you know understand the radio luminosity. 
Uh, but Scott Hyman, who discovered the original Galactic Center radio transient in 2004, 2005, um, he uh, emailed me and said, look, I wonder if maybe we could look in some archival data. I've got some GMRT data from like 2015. I could have a look if you like. And I was like, well, we know it's only going to be on for a few months because that's what 1627 did. And he was like, ah, give it a go. And it worked. So <laughs> started finding these archival detections from the VLA and GMRT. And of course, that drove me to then search the MWA archive. And I really, this is new data, and I'm, I'm so excited to show you this. Um, we actually looked back through the archive and found detections all the way back to 1988. Uh, I was five. So this is just, uh, it's just phenomenal. Um, I like to think that this is now longer than the span between Marty McFly getting in the time machine and, and going to 2015. It, it's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, so there some notable things like this is pre 9-11 down here. Um, yeah, so bonkers. Oh, the other date I'd really love to highlight on this plot is this one here, 2013-08-27. That was two weeks after the MWA had really started observing in earnest. And so if we had just happened to look at the data, if we'd had all of the modern tools uh, and our, our ways of looking through the data and you know understanding the calibration and imaging that we do now, we might have made this detection nearly 10 years ago. Uh, of course, none of that was the case. It took years and years and years to get all that software and expertise in place to know where and how to look. Uh, but this is the proof in the pudding. Um, you do that, you find all these detections, and you can line them up using a single period, um, of course, correcting for dispersion, barycentering, and so forth. Um, you can get a uh, measurement of that period to some precision. So this is a, a you know, Dev was reminds us of the importance of animations. And I also enjoyed Sammy's last talk. Um, the uh, changing the period shows how these uh, pulses, you know, start to not line up if you change the period. So that gives us some precision on our period measurement. Um, and also, I'll, I'll show you in a second, a constraint on how quickly that period could be changing, which is a very important physical quantity for understanding um, this object through the, the mechanism of, of pulsars. And it gives you um, uh, a, a rotational um, uh, luminosity, uh, which is this, this number here, which is very different from the radio luminosity. And so in the previous source, we had difficulty constraining PDOT because we only had three months. Now we have 33 years. Uh, this is a very, very tight constraint. And um, yeah, there's a very, very large difference uh, between these two numbers. You can fiddle around how you measure late radio luminosity. You can average over more time you can look at fainter pulses but for a given you know moderately bright pulse you can produce this much radio luminosity well how are you doing that with a spin luminosity that is much lower so that's really really interesting from physics point of view and uh this is a, a pp dot search diagram um we don't really we don't actually measure the p dot we can only set limits because uh, it's all kind of consistent with zero consistent with really really tiny numbers um but when you put it on a PP dot diagram, those limits are here. Uh, and maybe potentially Scott will pull another rabbit out the hat and we can um, you know, get these a, a tiny bit lower if we go to longer uh, time baselines. You can wait until I'm in my 60s and observing this with the MW uh, with the SKA and maybe we can get it a little bit lower. But it's enough to be very interesting and to potentially uh, you know, make us ask some deep questions about the physics of what's going on here. These are these are death lines for neutron star radio emission. Um, so, yeah, something something different is at play here. Um, we've tried to figure out what that different something could be uh, by looking with lots of other telescopes. Um, we didn't find anything with SWIFT. We did not find anything with XMM. Um, there is a very 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 marginal detection of a blob in the infrared with um, uh, the Gran Canaria telescope, and I've proposed for some VLT observations. We're thinking about putting in a request for JWST as well, because understanding what the host of this is, whether it's, you know, say some kind of very small dwarf star, maybe it's a white dwarf, maybe there's nothing there and it is a neutron star. 
uh, you know, that would really help us actually understand what's producing the radio emission. Um, I don't expect you to read everything on this slide, but I think the, the thing that's very interesting here is I went into this expecting to find more sources like J1627, where they are on for three months and they are very linearly polarized and, you know, they, they have these, these attributes. I thought maybe we'd find more variation in the period. And I came out with something that was different. You know, the pulses are morphologically different. The linear polarization is much lower. Um, the period is a bit longer. Um, and most staggeringly, it's on for 33 years. So that just shows I should go into finding the next thing with even less prior on what I might find. Uh, we could find anything, apparently. Um, I've mentioned before that, um, so we've crossed the death line for neutron stars. Uh, so maybe these things are white dwarf pulsars. If you just do a very, very back of the envelope, you can make a large moment of inertia, make this um, uh, luminosity uh, fit the data. But uh, it's, I still find this really philosophically weird. We know of like 15,000 white dwarfs and we only know one that acts as a pulsar and it's in a binary. And that being in a binary seems to be integral to it acting as a pulsar. So why are there, we finding these isolated 20 minute white dwarfs that outshine everything else in the sky. Maybe that's what they are, but it's, uh, it's very hard to tell. So we'll, we're ongoing. Um, a very, very silly population distribution test, you know, coming back to my pulsar distribution, where we measure this, these sources to be, do they agree with what you would expect if they were pulsars? The answer is kinda. <laughs> um, we found one here and we found one here and here's where you'd expect to find them. Modulo some bias against this area where uh, it's very, uh, very low elevation for the MWA and high noise because of Cygnus A. But I mean, two points you can, is that you could put anywhere on the plot and you could say they correspond. So we need to find more before we can do a, a, a proper test against different kinds of population predictions. So toward that end, uh, uh, Ikra generously funding uh, Sam McSweeney to come and work with me uh, over the next few years. And the main two prongs of our efforts will be um, getting through the archive. And uh, we've got like hundreds of hours of integration across all the galactic longitudes. In Greg's talk, uh, I mentioned he mentioned that I'd uh, suggested maybe we don't delete that data uh, because it could have lots of transients in it, even back to from the very first observations that the MWA made. So let's not delete them. Um, and Sam is uh, very interested in uh, the, the theory of these things, which is great because uh, I, I, I'm more of an observer. So uh, hopefully working together and hopefully with a new PhD student, um, we'll be able to find more and do some cool theory work to figure out what these things are. I'd also mention we've got a low file monitoring campaign, which actually does focus on this tantalizing northern hemisphere region. Uh, and the last epoch of that should be observed this month. So um, we will hopefully have some fainter things to look at soon. Thank you. That's perfect timing. I was a bit worried I'd gone way over. Uh, and also another um, Australian effort, which I'm quite excited about, is the VAST survey. So this is just showing a plot of the vast, sorry, variables and slow transients ASCAP survey. Uh, this is showing their pilot fields um, and uh, the green, I think the green ones, the pilot fields, and then the, uh, the colors are how much they observed. And uh, the final survey will have a kind of similar um, footprint, uh, but the galactic plane portion has uh, a lot larger footprint. And actually of all the ASCAP surveys, the vast galactic plane tranche was the only ASCAP survey to receive 100% of its proposed observing time because the scientific impact of these observations could be so high. Um, at operating at one gigahertz, you are going much deeper because your scattering horizon is further away and you can look at fainter things. However, uh, this radio SED really punishes you for going to higher frequencies. So while these sources are a bit fainter, the noise is a bit lower. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Um, I think it's really going to be about the volume sampled rather than the brightness of the sources. Um, that will be what the power uh, of the vast observations will allow us to do. So 
Uh, in conclusions, we used a live monitoring campaign to detect uh, an active long period radio transient. As it turned out, it had been there the whole time, which I think is hilarious. Uh, we, people could have found this when I was in diapers, but never mind. Um, it was, uh, we've, you know, this incredibly long uh, lever arm has allowed us to place amazing physical constraints and also getting everything across the, the wide band. Really crossed the death line now, um, and the paper is 99% done, slightly derailed by me having COVID last week, um, but hopefully to be submitted very soon. Um, so in future, we need to do more multi-wavelength follow-up. We need to find more of these things, ideally close by, um, and we should expect a zoo of objects. Uh, and a bonus thing I just point out that our lovely session chair has actually been helping me with um, some of the other cool transients that we found in this galactic plane monitoring data. So I, I think as Shanoa might have mentioned in her talk, I do hope to release that data to the collaboration. If Fozzie could stay up for more than five minutes at a time, uh, I can draw a line under that and um, uh, let other people have a look. So thank you very much for your time and uh, yeah, hope to be uh, uh, giving a, a, a talk next year where we actually figured out what these things are. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Natasha. Very interesting talk. Uh, we have a question from Brian. Brian, do you want to unmute and tell us? Very cool stuff, Natasha. Congratulations to you and your, your team on this. And uh, um, I'm sorry that you had to wear diapers until you were five. <laughs> you um, know what I mean. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, what What... Pulse profiles look really funky. Um, what sort of the smallest timescales and the longest sort of timescales you are seeing within within pulses? Yeah, so uh, sorry, let me get one where it's not moving around the whole time. Um, so the longest timescale uh, for one pulse is about 300 seconds. And yeah, if you do divide 300 seconds by 1,318 seconds, you get a pulse occupancy of like 25, 30%. So uh, from a beam geometry point of view, that's very, uh, that, that implies you're seeing a, a, a lot of the beam as it rotates through your line of sight, um, I think, which is difficult to reconcile with what we've been seeing in polarization, where once again, we see a very flat polarization angle, um, which I, I didn't get into because it's <laughs> kind of complicated for this talk. But yeah, with, uh, with the Meerkat data, just in the last week or so, we're constraining that polarization angle to be quite flat. So I don't know how you reconcile all of this. If you have thoughts, I'd be love, I'd love to hear them. I don't, yeah, I don't have any immediate answers. But um, the other part of my question is, so what, how, how narrow are the spikes that you're seeing? And I ask because Chime, Chime can potentially see these sorts of things, but it only things are only in transit for about 10 minutes. So uh, if there's little spikes within that duty cycle, then we'd have sensitivity. Yeah, let me see if I can find the paper. I'll have to show you offline. Um, but okay. basically, uh, there's a, um, we have a very nice meerkat dynamic spectrum, which I would love to show you. We got meerkat high time resolution data. And you can see substructure down to tens of milliseconds um, kind of time scale. There's also, a, right. you, you also see in these that there's this kind of um, quasi periodic oscillation. Um, if you do a lag analysis on all of this, you find that there's a sort of 50 second roughly um, oscillation going on. And so that kind of thing will be picked up better by your uh, FRB type searches. Uh, as well as the fine spikes. So yeah, there's no uh, smoking gun evidence that these produce um, FRB-like signals, but we didn't have very much data. It's very hard to get time on Meerkat, um, and we don't have very much data that really searches for them. So that's another exciting ongoing project. Great. Very cool stuff. Mm. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Brian, for your question. We have a question from Danny. Hi, Natasha. Uh, I just wanted to ask why you think it, these were not discovered back in 1988 or, or earlier. I know we've had some discussions, but I think it's an interesting question. Yeah, I mean, okay, so the 98, 1988 data, uh, that really does take a epic black belt interferometry person like Scott to be looking at exactly the right place at exactly the right time. Um, it was the, the data was sampled in 30 second cadence. 
So it's just one dot for one time sample in a you know multiple hour observation. I don't think anybody was doing what we would call fast imaging, right? They would have just been doing synthesis. So I don't think you would have found that unless you knew what you were looking for. Um, for the MWA, the real uh, changes um, have been a, a lot of what Sam mentioned, the sky model and the beam model, allowing us to do much better calibration. The imaging software, WS Clean, didn't exist in 2013. So dealing with the multi-scale um, complex emission of the galactic plane and finding a variable source underneath that, um, that would have been extremely challenging. Uh, and I think also there's just this effect that we didn't know to look for these sources. Um, you wouldn't uh, be designing a search particularly to look for pulsed, very long period emission, nor would you be designing your observations around that. So there certainly have been what I'm going to call puzzling low frequency transients in the past where people have just seen a blip. But because the observations weren't designed to then, you know, look for these things, no one was ever really sure if those things are, are actually real. So there's a there's quite a few examples of that. I can send you papers. Um, and it could be that they were all these kinds of intermittent periodic sources, but the data were never um, you know, designed in such a way that you could go back and check. And that again, if Stephen's listening, you know, said it before, we'll say it again. The wide field of view, the fact that we can keep looking at so many parts of the sky and come back to that data in the archive, even if it was somebody else's project pointing somebody somewhere else, you can use that data to get multiple measurements. Um, it's just incredibly powerful. I hope that answers your question. Sorry if it was a bit rambly. Uh, yeah, I think it does. I think the, the fact that interferometers were just not doing uh, fast imaging approaches uh, is, is pretty good. And I know we've discussed single dishes are not good on these kind of time scales. But... Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would point out, um, so some of these points come from V-Light. I do know V-Light, the very light, large array. Um, I'm sorry if I'm teaching my grandmother to suck eggs here. I'm, I'm a little bit out of it with COVID. Um, so VLight's been doing conventional transient searches on the VLA and Tracy Clark was able to go into that data and then once they knew where to look, find this source. Um, so I think they would have found it if they were resourced adequately to properly search all of the data that they've been taking. Because um, it really was just, oh, once you look, it's there. They just, it's a very, very small team. And so while they're trying to do this effort, they um, you know, haven't had the computational resources to churn through all of their data looking for all different kinds of transients. Right, okay, thanks. No worries. We'll have one last question from Sammy. Hey, yeah. Um, I just wanted to make a comment on the back of what Danny was just saying. Um, I think it would be really cool to go back and look at all of those historic blips that have been seen. Mm. Um, kind of in the same way that the Laura burst was like, oh yeah, it was an FRB in hindsight, probably. Um, yeah, I just think it would be really cool to go back and see whether or not any of the earlier stuff could also be attributed to sources like this. Yeah, that'd be really cool. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, Stuart at AL 2016, that thing they saw with LOFAR seems just like it. I, I, I think Scott's GCRT 1745, I mean, it's 77 minutes, which is longer again, but why not? Um, and all of these things break uh, pulsar emission models to varying degrees. Uh, I also, there's results I can't share because they're not mine to share, but I, I'm, there are going to be more of these things found that are going to challenge us even more. So uh, yeah, definitely, that's a, that's a, that, would be, that would be a fun thing to do. Right. Thank you, Natasha, again. That was very interesting. Great. So that concludes the first session of the day. We have a break now, so come back later for more talks about pulsars and transients. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the speakers, too, for wonderful talks. Thank you, Susmita, for chairing. Um, it was a great session. Our break is only a couple of minutes, um, unless... So, so we do have a, a pulsars... Sorry, the pulsars and fast transient session is up next, um, and we have a animation to show for for those that are interested. So um, that takes about six minutes. Um, so while the 
session itself doesn't start until 10 o'clock, we'll be showing this animation basically as soon as I can get it up and I'll also post the link into the chat so that you can watch it. Um, it is a very smooth animation, but um, coming over my computer, it might not appear to be so. Um, so just keep that in mind. But yes, the, the session starts at 10 o'clock, everyone. Hi, Kat, uh, are you there? Are you, you are chairing the next session, right? Can you hear me, Kat? Okay, I can't hear you, so I was just going to check if uh, the screen share works for me or not, if that is okay. I can hear you as well, Ramesh, but I see you oh. online now. Yep. So, oh, I, go ahead. Can you hear me now? Is that, <laughs> yes. is that better? Yes, 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 better. Um, so, uh, let me see if I uh, uh, go back to where I was calling it from. Uh, Kat, can you also give me like a, a 10 minutes uh, kind of a warning instead of, because I'm doing like a two group update. So, if you tell me like 10 minutes before the time, it will be useful. Yeah, sure. I'll give you a, a 10 minutes. Um, okay, fantastic. For anyone else giving a talk, um, I'll give you a two minute warning um, unless you speak now saying you don't want that. <laughs> the only person here is Bradley and he's not saying anything. Okay, I'm going to play the video if that's okay. Let me know if you can't hear Scott talking or if you can't hear that intro music. When a massive star comes to the end of its life cycle, the nuclear fusion reaction in its core, which has been balancing the crushing force of gravity, begins to fail. The star collapses in on itself in a core collapse supernova. One possible outcome of this supernova event is the creation of an extremely dense remnant called a neutron star. Neutron stars are small, born rapidly spinning, with speeds ranging from one rotation per minute to 700 rotations per second. They have powerful magnetic fields, about 100 million times stronger than an MRI machine, and intense radiation that streams out from their poles, analogous to the rays from a lighthouse, and these beams sweep across the cosmos. If they pass over the Earth, we see a brief pulse of radio light each time the star rotates. These neutron stars are called pulsars, and astronomers have detected more than 3,000 in our own galaxy over the past 50 years. But we want to find more. For astronomers, pulsars serve as unique cosmic laboratories and can be used to explore a myriad of topics in physics. We have been studying pulsars for decades, but there is still much we don't know about them. But they do let us explore many aspects of physics and astrophysics, including nuclear matter, plasma physics, gravity, and the life cycle of stars. One of the largest international collaborative efforts involving pulsars, the Pulsar Timing Array, aims to measure the signature of galaxies merging in the early universe, where their central black holes colliding sent ripples across the fabric of space-time. These ripples combine with each other and change the distance between a pulsar and the Earth as they pass through the galaxy. By monitoring enough pulsars across the sky, we can detect these ripples and measure the gravitational wave background signal. Searching for new pulsars is a long but important process, and often leads to exciting discoveries. Some of the most interesting pulsars found have been in binary systems, where the pulsar and another object orbit each other. There are different kinds of pulsar binary systems, and each can help astronomers answer different questions. Pulsars in orbit with other pulsars, neutron stars, or white dwarf stars, allow us to research what happens inside extreme gravity conditions. Pulsars in orbit with normal stars allow us to explore stellar evolution and how the winds blowing from stars interact with companion objects.
Something we have yet to find is a pulsar orbiting a black hole, which would be a gold standard physics laboratory. In addition to these binary systems, we also find pulsars that are not steady cosmic lighthouses, or seem to switch on and off occasionally. Studying these objects can help us determine just how pulsars produce the emissions we detect. So how can we find more? The Murchison Widefield Array, or MWA, is a radio frequency telescope in the Western Australian outback and is undertaking an ambitious pulsar search project through the Southern MWA Rapid 2 Meter, or SMART, pulsar survey. There are several things that make SMART special. One of the biggest advantages, compared to other similar efforts around the world, is that the MWA can observe the entire southern sky very quickly. Previous generation surveys using traditional dish telescopes could only observe small patches of sky at a time, and only for a few minutes each. This takes thousands of hours to look at the entire southern sky. The MWA, on the other hand, can look at patches of sky a thousand times larger than the moon, so the whole observable sky can be covered in only 70 observations, and can look for 20 times longer. Overall, the Smart Pulsar Survey will observe three quarters of the entire sky in only 100 hours, collecting millions of gigabytes of data, and still be more sensitive than previous surveys at similar wavelengths. This observing efficiency exchanges survey speed for substantial computing needs, requiring resources from supercomputing centers around Australia to process all of the data. Through the use of premier Australian science facilities and international collaboration, the SMART survey is in a strong position to discover potentially hundreds of new pulsars, including some uniquely interesting ones. The SMART pulsar survey will provide a valuable resource for the next generation of radio telescopes such as the upcoming Square Kilometre Array that have primary science goals including the study of pulsars and gravity. Great, well um, that was a very cool animation um, but I guess we shall start by jumping straight in without any further ado for Ramesh to give us a bit of a science overview um, before we head into the rest of the Pulsar and Transient session. So Ramesh, you can take it away whenever you want. You do seem to be still on mute if you're talking. Yep. Oh, okay, sorry. There we sorry. go. Okay, thanks. All right. Okay, so good morning everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, if that uh, makes more sense to you. So today I have a, a two-fold task. One is to give a short update on behalf of uh, Gemma Anderson, who is the science uh, theme lead for Transience Working Group. And uh, also on behalf of a PFT Science Group, I will be giving an update on uh, some of the activities in that group. And in both cases, basically covering bits and pieces that are not necessarily covered in detail in uh, other presentations. Uh, okay. All right, so under uh, Gemma's uh, leadership, and uh, there has been uh, quite a bit of effort to uh, um, uh, organize uh, the Transience Working Groups, and Transience, as you know, has uh, a whole bunch of uh, different uh, areas and pretty, you know, vast subjects, so there are now a routine uh, theme-based meetings happening uh, on a regular basis covering uh, polarized transient, flare stars, and FRBs, and gravitational wave events. And typically these uh, meetings are attended by about a dozen people, uh, mostly uh, Perth or Curtin-based uh, team members, and also members from other institutions, including CSIRO, uh, um, uh, uh, institutions from uh, Shanghai, and also other parts of the world. And as you can imagine that uh, they all, often there is also like quite a bit of crossover with other areas of uh, PFT science like FRBs and cosmic rays in particular. 
And one interesting highlight is a, a large meeting that was uh, held uh, early this year and uh, that was a joint meeting with uh, uh, the WAS team, particularly to explore MWASCAP uh, synergies in the transient space. And there was a lot of interest in uh, obviously polarized transients and player stars and also and uh, on the prospect of uh, uh, doing some coordinated galactic plane monitoring and you heard a lot about uh, this ultra long period transients from uh, Natasha just earlier today and uh, there are some very interesting uh, avenues there to explore that and uh, so that was early this year and uh, obviously you know that now these meetings are routine and uh, so if you are interested in any of the transient related activities please feel free to get in uh, touch with uh, Gemma. So I'm just going to uh, present uh, a couple of uh, slides that I um, um, received from Gemma. And uh, so there has been quite a bit of work on uh, developing this uh, rapid response uh, trigger mode for MWA, which is essentially a containerized uh, web app that you can run on a project basis. At the moment, it is getting uh, tested on uh, GRB triggering on MWA. And this is a project supported by uh, ADAX. It's called TRACE-T, which is a transient rapid response using coordinated event triggering. But most importantly, that there are plans to upgrade this and expand this project to include a gravitational wave triggers, and which is especially in keeping in mind the upcoming O4 science run. And that is the work that has been proposed for the uh, next semester. Um, uh, many of these uh, um, things are coming from a whole bunch of interesting questions that you would like to ask in the context of a, a potential FRB-like emission that you can detect from uh, BNS mergers. And there are models out there that predicts like uh, what should expect or not depending on the viewing angle and uh, how long and what cadence and things like that, all revolving around uh, neutron star magnetic field interactions or theta ism interactions or magnetar collapsing into a black hole under different scenarios. So June and uh, Gemma have been uh, looking at uh, the detection prospects uh, in such a scenario and what is shown there at the bottom two panels is the expected fluence for these models as a function of the viewing angle, which is the color bar there, and the distance, of course. And what is shown there is like uh, the sensitivity that you can expect from MWA for different configurations. There's a lot of flexibility with MWA that you can reconfigure. For instance, when you do it as a full array, you will get that uh, maximum sensitivity, which is that black dotted line. And the red one is when you split the telescope into four different subarrays. And the blue one is when you use like uh, a completely crazy model, like just a single dipole from every single dial. On the right path, that is like a simulated population of BNS mergers and uh, from uh, the three detector configuration for uh, Li uh, LIGO, Virgo, Kagra, and which is going to be the for science run. And that is the black dotted line and the detectable population with the MWA are shown in the blue, that is for the full array, the red for the four subarrays, and the single dipole case is the black um, uh, dash dotted line. The bottom line here is that uh, the four subarrays um, uh, more seems to be like a the very good trade-off between sensitivity and the detecting an event. And uh, that's basically the strategy being uh, pursued at this point. Again, this is work done by June and uh, Gemma and the team. And what is shown here is like a, 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 a detector sensitivity for uh, the gravitational wave events convolved with uh, sky coverage and sensitivity of MWA. If I understand right, basically to understand uh, the chance probability of detecting an event if MWA was looking some whatever some random arbitrary direction, and once you have a trigger from a, in a four subarray mode, then um, could be potentially using a three minutes buffer or some uh, sort of a latency. Then you switch to full array and record it for something like six hours or something. That's the maximum you can do with the, the new high time resolution system. Obviously, all this is to look for like a few milliseconds of uh, FRB-like emission, but as we all know, that could be really game changer. And the optimistic uh, expectation here is that uh, MWA could be like a potentially detecting at least one such event in uh, all four science run. So if you want to know more details, please feel free to uh, ask questions and uh, hopefully June is online and might be able to clarify uh, the details for you. Uh, June is going to uh, present this work, but as you heard from yesterday, and there has been also like a work that is done using uh, VCS data and the smart data, and that is collected for PULSA survey, trying to look at the FRB uh, so like emission from uh, repeating FRBs. There is a whole sample of uh, repeating FRBs, and uh, June's work focused on five such uh, uh, repeating FRBs, four from CHIME and one from ASCAP. 
And again, I don't want to steal the thunder, but the bottom line here is that this is the very first search using a VCS data and uh, processing almost 23 hours of data and getting down to the fluency limits of something like an order of magnitude better than many of the previous uh, searches. But uh, let us also like uh, take a moment to congratulate uh, June for his uh, successful thesis submission that was a few months ago. And I gather that examiner reports have arrived and uh, he's working on the corrections. So pretty much in the path for uh, soon to be a uh, doctor uh, category. Okay, so now I very quickly switch, um, uh, switching to the PFT uh, science update and PFT science, as you can imagine, the science that you can do with the uh, voltage capture system, which is our high time resolution backend and the whole bunch of software and processing pipelines that we have uh, developed around that, that includes the beam former, pulsar processing software and such. So in principle, they can support uh, an array of uh, uh, science themes, and but pulsars have been uh, the most uh, dominant activity. And as you have heard, the Smart Survey Project, which is the big ambitious survey to survey the entire southern sky for pulsars and fast transients, is one such a large project in the collaboration. So this is quite a relatively new science working group, and currently we have uh, 20 members. A lot of core activity still uh, happens at uh, Kurt, based at Curtin which is all the development of uh, the high time resolution backend system and the software uh, suite of uh, suite associated with that, which is called the VCS Beam. And given the scope of the work and uh, size of the team, uh, so at the moment we have a relatively thin uh, management structure, which is primarily me as the group lead and uh, Sam McSweeney, which is, uh, who is the software lead. And for activity like that, we realized that, uh, you know, it's very important to have a dedicated uh, uh, lead for uh, looking after the software and processing uh, um, um, uh, aspects of the whole system. And as you heard, you know, that Sammy will be like a changing the color of his cap and will be moving into a, a transient group uh, that's in February. So the Bradley Myers will be stepping into that particular role and uh, starting from early next year. So just before the board meeting last time, we uh, submitted a draft uh, working policy, the SWG working policy covering pretty much a different aspects of the proposal coordination and uh, the large projects and student projects and so on. And that has been endorsed by the board and uh, it is now uh, there on the wiki. So if you can go and uh, look, in, uh, look up for uh, any particular details that might be of interest to you. Okay, so uh, switching to the uh, science aspects and uh, so uh, there has been a lot of uh, work being done on uh, the follow up of uh, uh, smart pulsar number two. And this is something that you heard from Sammy's excellent presentation uh, in the last project meeting. A pulsar that was independently discovered by a smart but turns out to be like a very interesting uh, source for understanding pulsar emission mechanism. It shows a lot of interesting uh, and very peculiar subpulse drifting behavior and it also nulls for a very large fraction of the time. And uh, Parul is going to present a lot of interesting work that is done using uh, uh, the GMRT data that we collected last year. So I don't want to uh, steal the thunder, but as you can see that uh, the pulsar does a lot of uh, interesting things here. What is shown here is uh, a sequence of uh, pulses, about a few hundred. And every once in a while, Pulsar comes on and does like a lot of interesting uh, regular kind of uh, patterns and that's called subpulse drifting. So you will hear more about it from uh, Farul's presentation in a short while. The smart survey description paper, many of you have seen this uh, doing the rounds in the collaboration review and it was submitted for uh, 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 to the journal almost a couple of months ago and we have received uh, the referee comments and we have been working quite hard on addressing the referee comments and the plan is to submit it uh, within uh, before the break and uh, so I probably won't uh, talk too much about it and as such you will be hearing bits and pieces about it from uh, in the next two presentations. So other interesting work uh, that's being done, uh, this is from uh, Parul, so this is another very interesting bright pulsars uh, from simultaneous MW and GMRT observations. And this is a pulsar that has practically no nulling, you know, that not even a single pulse is drawn to null. And it has, uh, you know, that very interesting looking, uh, simple looking profile, but very, very bright with uh, some of us. What is shown here in the middle panel is uh, the profile uh, changes as a function of frequency. And as you can see that uh, many of the GMRT bands, pulsar has, uh, you know, so uh, almost look like a textbook quality with a signal-to-noise ratio per average profile reaching almost 10,000 in one hour. 
So that makes it like every single pulse detectable with a signal to noise ratio of 100 or more. That makes it like a very interesting uh, uh, object to study the single pulse uh, energy and fluence and distributions and other things. In the combination with the MWA data allows you to look at uh, the average properties and it's the frequency dependence. And a couple of interesting highlights are shown here. The bottom panel is the MWA profile, which as you can see that uh, it's a much more uh, scatter broadened than that you see in the MWA band. And the descatter profile shows some interesting looking uh, post cursor emission, which might be to do with either pulsars of viewing geometry or something which has like a steeper spectrum than uh, the main pulse profile. And the top panel is uh, pretty much uh, the power's best attempt to revisit the spectral uh, characteristics of these pulsars by using the combination of the data from GMRT and uh, MWA. And the main uh, highlight here is that uh, spectrum turns out to be something with a low frequency turnover, much in contradiction with the many of the things that was said about these pulsars from very sparse measurements and uh, you know that limited frequency coverage in the past. Again, that paper is in the collaboration review and it's on well track for submission uh, before the break. I mentioned this in the last uh, project meeting and the MWA pulsars and many of them are turning out to be like a pretty low luminosity pulsars and oftentimes uh, very barely detectable even using a park sensitivity at the L band. So we have started this project to use a fast telescope to do their detailed characterization. This is a project that is led by Ming Yao. And, uh, uh, Again, you know, that uh, one-tenth of Emily Jansky is a quite almost like a breeze for fast sensitivity. What is shown on the right is a high-quality detection from a fast telescope. One of the projects that we have been doing in the past few months is uh, basically to use uh, using this pulsar and other uh, MWA detector pulsars like the one which I mentioned to probe the high-latitude turbulence of uh, in the ISM. And this is interestingly the part of the sky where there are practically no measurements at the moment. In, uh, in terms of like uh, the uh, scattering or scintillation measurements. And as a matter of fact, you know, that electron density models are pretty much uh, very poorly constrained and many of them can't even like give uh, accurate distances and they run out of electrons at the part of the DM when space when it is more than like uh, 20 parsec per centimeter cube. So the idea is basically to look at uh, the fast sensitivity and GMRT sensitivity to make some very useful measurements so that you can refine these models or input to refining this model and that's the kind of region which is also interest for like a lot of FRB interpretations. And what is shown on the right is the dynamic spectrum from multiple uh, fast observations and uh, you can detect the scintils and you can do some correlation function analysis and uh, deduce some parameters that can turn into like uh, interesting parameters like uh, mean turbulent strength. Interestingly, that turns out to be like a, a lot less turbulent than uh, the, some of the model predictions. And uh, that might be something that we might be factor in and contribute to refining uh, the ISM models at the high latitude part of the sky. Okay, so uh, back to uh, uh, the system development. And uh, so I'm going to show a, a bunch of slides from uh, Sammy. And uh, so those who don't know, uh, very much and the legacy VCS system. So we were recording the data after two stages of channelization and our software pipelines pretty much was geared to produce a, a data products that is good for like a millisecond pulsar studies by getting a inverse PFP operation done and the microsecond time resolution voltage data that you can coherently redisperse or generate the data that is good for like a smart like project or a single pulsar studies. In the new system, the big difference is that we are tapping the signal at a different point right after the course PFB and then doing everything under like a new system which is called uh, MWAX VCS. And uh, the idea there was like uh, pretty much you develop the system that can cater to all the applications that we were able to do before and also like uh, many more including like a cosmic rays and rapid imaging and uh, other applications. That was a vision that was drawn by uh, Sammy as a software lead uh, of more than a year ago. And as you might remember from our last project meeting, and uh, we have made a lot of progress. The part of the things that is required for like a supporting Pulsar and FRB science is already there. And uh, one big change over the last five months is like uh, also taking this uh, offline correlation. And that's a bit that uh, Sammy has tested quite successfully by help from uh, Ian and also uh, help from uh, Jarrett and who is uh, doing an honors project over the past summer. 
Uh, a big development here is like uh, to sorting out one of the interesting software bug that was causing some uh, renormalization, which was typically seen as like an interesting uh, uh, gradient in the frequency across the frequency or sometimes some sort of a strange modulation. Like uh, many other uh, uh, software bugs in the complex subsystems like that, it took a quite a bit of effort to trace it, what was causing it, and uh, it has been fixed. And uh, that's a contribution that's coming from uh, Jared Mosley, and who was working with uh, uh, Sam McSweeney over the past summer. And as you can, as you heard, that Sammy will be like uh, changing uh, his uh, um, um, role um, uh, um, uh, in the next few months, and uh, switching to the from uh, fast transients and pulsars to slow transients and long period transients. So we have pretty much like a uh, redrawn this box in the sense that uh, you know that in the near future, at least the VCS beam will be like a pretty much uh, the you know the uh, capability that we have developed up until now, which is like uh, ability to support pulsars and the uh, fast transient uh, science, and uh, we won't be like uh, giving prioritizing uh, the other part of the development, which is still pretty much part of the plan, but not a priority in the coming months. Okay, so this is uh, uh, another slide that I showed uh, uh, the last meeting. So I just want to give a, a quick clarification and some bunch of updates, and you heard a lot about. Uh, the next flow uh, benefits from uh, Dave Null's presentation uh, yesterday. And I just want to mention that, uh, you know, that in terms of like, uh, you know, the next flow in the pipeline, the big task we have is doing it for the so-called the second pass search for the smart, which I will describe in a minute. And uh, in fact, as a matter of fact, the current first pass search that we have been doing has been next floored by none other than Nick Swainston. And we have been running it like that since uh, almost a year and a half. Because with the kind of task at hand and with the kind of team we have, there is no way we could have run, uh, sustained this sort of an activity without uh, the next floor pipeline. So basically we are talking about like uh, producing thousands of beams from every single VCS observations, producing uh, uh, several thousands of DM trials and dealing with the zillions of candidates. So pretty much like uh, routinely submitting thousands and thousands of jobs on a HPC like a O-Star. So this transition was made by uh, uh, Nick Swainston and uh, uh, almost a year and a half ago. But obviously the second pass search pipeline, which you will hear from uh, Bradley, and will be like quite a expanded uh, a version of the current uh, pipeline. Uh, for the rest of the things, and it's not really high on the priority, but uh, as you may have heard yesterday, there's a lot of interest in uh, like uh, probably from a solar science to use picket fence mode observations and doing some uh, useful uh, family rotation and magnetic field measurements of uh, solar science. So if there is a strong push coming from that particular direction, and we might be like prioritizing uh, the picket fence uh, uh, capability of the new MX VCS. Yes, yeah? 10 minutes left, Mesh. Okay, fantastic. All right, okay, in the last 10 minutes, I'm going to give you a very quick uh, highlight on where things stand with uh, SMART. Um, um, the, it's a quite an ambitious project to cover the entire uh, sky visible to the MWA in uh, using uh, it uh, makes a uh, uh, basically takes advantage of the voltage capture system that can record high time resolution data over the entire field of view and uh, using uh, the uh, offline uh, beam forming and pulsar searching that's what essentially uh, the project is about. Over the last three and a half semesters, we have covered something like 70% uh, of the sky, and we can only do this project when the array is uh, configured in the compact configuration. So that brings like almost two to three orders of magnitude saving in uh, beam forming cost. So that slide basically shows a summary of where we are, which is like a four new pulsars from uh, the so-called first pass processing. That's only like a processing 10% of the data and doing only like a basic periodicity search. And the red dots are essentially the redetected pulsars. And as you can see, that the galactic plane part of the sky is not covered yet. So we are waiting for the blessing from our management. And at some point, when we have uh, uh, the compact configuration back, and that's when we are eagerly looking forward to completing uh, this particular uh, uh, project. And uh, so that the survey, we can complete the whole smart as it was originally planned. So I already reported uh, three new pulsars. It's already uh, mentioned in uh, the multiple smart papers. And just a quick update on so-called pulsar four and five. The pulsar four was detected after adding a second layer of uh, ML uh, pattern recognition tool. And this was the work of Xuyang Fu and a master student working with the Ming Yao. 
So originally the pulsar was seen as a six sigma not so promising candidate, but the algorithm thought that was like a very interesting object and they're sure it turned out to be like an interesting real pulsar. But just before the proposal deadline for GMRT and parts, it turned out that uh, it's a pulsar that was an essentially a rediscovery, but was incorrectly reported in the literature with the wrong name, no accurate position, no timing solution, but with a completely wrong DM. So we did some GMRT follow-up and initial follow-up basically resulted in a non-detection. That's mainly because we didn't have a very good position. And the GMRT observations were made in a concurrent imaging mode. So the imaging of the field was has showed like a multiple point sources. And so in the second attempt, then we went and formed a phased array with the each and every one of those prospective candidate targets. Four of them turned out to be like a red cross and one of them turned out to be like a essentially green tick. So the first are basically like a confirmed and we know a little bit more about it and the position uh, is good to like a couple of arc second uncertainty and then estimated flux density of something like a, a half to one milli the real new highlight is uh, the pulsar number five, and this is coming from Garvith Grover. So first, when Garvith spotted this candidate, and uh, many people, including myself, were highly skeptical because we thought it's too good to be uh, a cup cap, uh, you know, candidate pulsar for MWA. It was like a lot brighter than the one which we have seen before. But Garvith didn't really give up, and they did a lot of thorough investigation. And the quick summary is that uh, it was detected in a multiple different observations sometimes also in the side log and all with a similar can period and DM and uh, the so-called suspected pulsar was not even seen in a beamform data and obviously that's a lot of mounting evidence over the course of weeks, uh, several weeks, but the most importantly the profile structure looks completely different. So obviously the no two pulsars can have identical looking uh, pulse profiles and can be located in the same part of the universe and shining at you at, at the same time. It's almost like a pulsar exclusion principle. So this is now, you know, basically known as like a garbage pulsar. And quite a bit of progress there. Then this is the luxury we have with the uh, MWA data. You can go back and uh, make a very dense grid of beams and get down to the position to something like a couple of arc minutes using the compact configuration. And uh, using the archival data, in this particular case, we were able to get down to like a half an arc minute position. So we can now happily go back to GMRT and parks and do like a more detailed follow up. And what's more that we even have like a timing solution. You know, usually when you find a pulsar, people will go back to the telescope and uh, get uh, follow up observation through the timing. And we are doing like completely a different strategy. And uh, this is all coming from uh, the fact that uh, the pulsar was located in the not so comfortable part of the beam and very sparse sampling over the last time span. And if you believe garbage analysis, we already have like a thousand sigma kind of a P dot and a period which is like a good to like a 12th decimal place. To me, this is an excellent demonstration of the timing stability of the system over uh, several years. Okay, this is my last slide. So basically, you know, the progress so far, we have covered three quarter of the sky and only a small fraction of the data has been processed that to only in first pass. So we are literally scratching the surface and the multiple papers are under collaboration review or in the literature or at works. The real, real big task at hand is uh, moving to um, the second pass processing. It is not just like uh, going from first to second pass by an increment of one. It's like a pretty major scale up and step up in the processing and you will hear a lot more about it from Bradley. And another important task here is also like uh, solving this uh, class imbalance problem. And we have bravely put Ethan Dowley, who is uh, our summer intern on that task and he's uh, supervised by none other than Sammy McSweeney. So we can put a lot of uh, trust and optimism that uh, that problem will be like solved, hopefully in the coming semester. So more coming from uh, Bradley, but I'm happy to take any questions. Great. Well, thank you, Ramesh. That was a really fantastic summary of where everything is at. Um, it's great to see results coming out already. Uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to raise your hand or put it in the chat. Sammy is raising hand here. I can see that. Okay. Well, Sammy, yes. I just wanted to make one small clarification. Um, uh, just give credit where credit is due. The offline correlated work, um, Jared and me, we didn't actually do any development on that. The code is entirely like Ian et al. And we basically just installed it and got it working on on it, working as an offline in an offline mode. So yeah, just wanted to put that out there. Thanks. Cool. Um, 
if I can't see any other questions, I do have a very quick one. Um, but maybe in the meantime, if you stop sharing and then Bradley, you can get yourself yeah, set up. Um, so I had a question about the really high signal to noise um, pulsar work. I mean, maybe I should be leaving it for, for later, but um, the really high signal to noise, it did look literally just like a textbook example. Um, is that related to that high signal to noise? Because I know that pulse structures can be all over the place. And um, do we expect these really high signal to noise pulsars to have a nicer shaped pulsar, pulse shape? Not, not necessarily, not necessarily. Right. That pul pulsar is like a quite an exceptional one. And it just so <laughs> happens to have like a very simple profile. And right. that's also the reason that was like an excellent uh, source for uh, looking at uh, the so-called pulse fluence distribution and the single pulse mm -hmm. variability. Because typically, mm -hmm. as you can imagine, pulse will have like sub-pulses, sometimes drifting uh, uh, sub-pulses and things like that. So there are, you know, pulsars, there's quite a large uh, slew of uh, pulsars when it comes to pulse profiles. Everyone is an individual. They all have their own profiles. It's almost like a face. So this is basically an exceptional uh, kind of a pulsar. And uh, yeah, right. that's not nice like the signal to noise ratio. <laughs> For example, pulsars okay. like 0950 can have like a similarly very high signal to noise ratio at those frequencies, but they have much more complex structure. Right. Okay. Um, thank you for the clarification. So up next, we'll keep going with smart results and um, hear from Bradley to take over. I won't give any more intro. Bradley, I'll give you a two minute warning, um, which will allow time for question time. So there'll be a bit more of a buffer as well. Great. Take it away. Okay. Um, thanks for giving me the opportunity to tell you all about the next stage of the Smart Pulsar survey processing. Um, Ramesh hinted at it, obviously, that uh, I am sort of taking the leading role in that. And so I'll go over a little bit of just current status, more of the sort of the technicalities of what we're dealing with, and then delve into some of the major points we're currently looking into about how do we solve some of the problems we need to solve for the second pass, um, and then sort of looking forward uh, what's going to happen. So the current status, what are we, where we're at and challenges we face, so um, lots of this Ramesh already covered, but we've collected about 75% of the observations we need to cover, um, and we're going from plus 30 to essentially the South Pole. We've covered a wide range of the RA, but we're missing sort of this strip down here uh, that's not coloured in on this diagram on the right, and just so happens that, that that actually just entirely maps basically the galactic plane and galactic centre, which I should note is a very interesting region for pulsars, but also it's quite challenging for uh, low frequency observations. And so in some way, it's a good thing that we save that till last because that'll be the hardest bit to process, um, but also it's sort of the most exciting bit, so we definitely want to get that in the can. But to date, we have 51 BCS observations on the archive, which is about 2.1 petabytes of data, and that was observed between September 2018 and May 2021. How much of that have we actually processed? Well, uh, so we've done sort of our, I suppose, proof of concept shallow pass, which is the first pass. We only analyzed the first 10 minutes of each of the observations, and we didn't do any fancy processing. We didn't do any RFI mitigation. We used a very coarse dispersion plan, so we only sort of tried 2,500 different values for each pointing, which sounds like a lot, but just wait, I'll show you what's actually a lot. Um, and we only really did a basic periodicity search, so we only looked for sort of just standard spinning um, uh, periodic signals, nothing fancy above that. But in doing that, we've processed 80% of the 51 observations, and because we're only processing um, 10 minutes of that, that basically means we're only about 8 to 10 percent of the actual total data volume has been processed. So we've still got a lot to go. Um, and of all of the candidates that have come out of that, we've really only looked at a small fraction of those as well. Um, so, uh, you know, still heaps left to actually sort of finish up with the shallow pass, even while we're moving on to the second pass. But even still, we've managed to find a handful of new pulsars. This diagram on the right is actually out of date. There should be five black stars on there rather than three. Um, but the red dots are sort of uh, redetections of known pulsars with smart data. And then the, the um, black stars, which you saw in Ramesh's talks, should be five, are sort of the new smart discoveries. Um, some of the technical aspects. So. Um, part of a pulsar search is your dispersion plan, and so essentially this is 
um, trying to account for the fact that pulsars are at different distances and there's a different amount of stuff between us and the pulsar, and it smears out the pulsar signal, so we have to correct for that. And so we have to do this at various different trials along the way uh, before moving on. Here on the left, I've got on the, on the y-axis is the smearing time, which you can kind of think of as effect, the effective time resolution we, we deal with. And on the x-axis is we have dispersion measure from about 1 to 250 dm units. The blue line here is our sampling time, and it steps up from 100 microseconds as we move to higher and higher dms, or essentially having, having 100 microseconds time resolution doesn't buy you anything as you go to higher and higher dms, so you may as well downsample. The real limiting factor here is actually this orange line, which is the intra-channel smearing, so that's the the residual delay left over within our 10 kilohertz channels, and we can never do better than that um, with the current data processing we have in hand. Um, and so essentially we'll never do better than that, and the course plan that we used here is essentially following these, uh, hopefully you can see my cursor, the purple the kind of red lines, you can see it's sort of stepping up here. This is the plan we used. So essentially we, we limited ourselves to about a millisecond uh, a, a sort of effective time resolution, even at the lowest DMs, up to about 20 milliseconds at uh, 250. This also has direct impacts on the sensitivity um, of the survey. So now on the right is, again on the x-axis, is the dispersion measure, but on the y-axis now we have the detectable flux density. For various different uh, rotational speeds at various different system temperatures and with and without scattering. But the main takeaway here is that the Dispersion plan on the left here directly impacts what the um, sensitivity on the right here looks like. And what this is saying is that we're not fantastic at finding fast pulsars with the current um, data processing plan. We're pretty good at finding slower pulsars, even at sort of um, when it's close to the galaxy where our system temperature is higher. And even with scattering, we can still make it up to about 100 um, dm units. Um, but we need to sort of address this and sort of um, look at other de-dispersion plans that optimize this for, for the survey. Hurdles along the way, there's been many, but I'll just hand uh, a couple of them. So the first one is that our data processing is all essentially on the OzStar supercomputing cluster in Swinburne, um, but the data is stored at Pawsey, so that's obviously an issue. Um, we've relied on Garawala and the Astro file system as sort of an, an intermediate data transfer and staging area for us to move things across, and so the transfer time is actually quite large, even for only 10 minutes of data. Um, but of course, when we ran into a whole bunch of issues with Astro um, this year, that stalled the data transfer, and stalling the data transfer means there's no new data, which means there's no new processing happening. So we actually have kind of been stuck for the last few months just not being able to do much, um, essentially because we couldn't get new data moved across. The other thing is that we have so many candidates that we just actually cannot inspect them all. Um, and Ramesh already mentioned this, but we have things coming up to implement ML classifiers, um, and that'll be really crucial for actually dealing with this, as well as implementing some kind of RFI mitigation. Uh, and finally, sort of more of an organizational issue, I suppose, is that we have various things changing within the group. So Nick Swainson's wrapping up his PhD and starting his new position at CIC, um, and he was leading the SMART uh, survey. Sam McSmith is moving on to work on long period transients, and so we'll still be vaguely involved but won't be leading any of the processing. Um, and I have just started uh, back at Cairo in August and I'm taking the lead role uh, developing and processing the deep pass. So next stage is what is the deep pass and what are we going to be doing to get the full scale processing online? Well the first thing we're going to do is we're going to include RFI mitigation. Um, even though the observatory side is really very nice in terms of its RF quietness, we still see both impulsive and periodic varieties of RFI. On the right here is an example of that. Um, you would say, oh, well, you know, if I'm looking at this uh, diagnostic plot on the right, that kind of looks like a little bit of a pulsar signal on the top left, but the aficionados among you will look at the other plots and realize, oh, no, that doesn't look very good. And in fact, it's not uh, very good. And I have some additional slides later on that we can go into some details, but trust me in this, it's definitely RFI, it's not a real pulsar. But we're exploring ways to deal with this both before the data processing, before the actual 
um, search happens and also after the search. We have to revisit our dispersion plan um, to reduce the degradation in our data. So on the left is the same plot that I showed before, smearing time, effective time resolution versus dispersion measure for the first pass. And on the right is a more optimized one where we essentially try to get as close to this orange line as we can because we can't do better than that. The problem is that when we do that is we are more than, well, it's about seven times the, num the number of dispersion trials, which means there's seven times as much intermediate data that we have to produce. So that's a problem, uh, but we can deal with it. The other thing we want to do is extend our DM search range. So not only do we want to do it um, more precisely, but we want to go up to maybe DMs of 3,000 or 4,000 may as well, um, especially since those higher DMs actually don't cost a lot in terms of compute, but it's, again, another factor of two in terms of actually how many DM trials you have to um, create. So again, it's becoming more a data volume and um, I.O. issue rather than a compute issue at that stage. Anyway. We're still exploring this, but these are the sort of considerations we're making. Um, we also, of course, with our updating our DM uh, dispersion trials, we want to look at our sensitivity. So the big difference here is we're going from 10 minutes to an 80 minutes integration, um, but we also have slightly different uh, time resolutions going on, and that all affects these uh, sensitivity curves. But what I want to point out here is that even at a dispersion measure of one, our effective time resolution is only 300 microseconds. So it's three times the actual native resolution. Um, and that impacts our sensitivity, especially to the fast pulsars. And so if we really want to um, hone down on these kinds of things, we really have to uh, do something novel for our um, VCS data and sort of apply coherent dispersion, which I won't go into, but we can discuss later if people are interested in what that is. Uh, but that will really drive that down. But otherwise, um, it's quite promising. We're looking somewhere between three and five millijanskis as a sort of a, a reasonable estimate for what our sort of limiting sensitivity might be. We also have to consider the realities of our observing strategy. So the MWA primary beam is static uh, in telescope coordinates in all as, but we track RA index, so that moves with the sky. Um, and that's actually quite unique for pulsar surveys. Um, that's not normally a consideration people have to make, and, but we have to make that uh, consideration. So one consequence is that it's actually computationally inefficient to beamform all of our sky positions for the full 80 minutes. For instance, some sky positions end up being in a primary beam null, so what's the point in adding noise to your, um, to your pointing observation? A consequence of that is actually that we essentially add more noise to the data if we do it, and so we could, in theory, be decreasing our sensitivity by um, just blindly beamforming on the 80 minutes. Counter to that, though, is that longer tracks also improve our chances of detecting bright single pulses, as well as longer period pulses, so we have to strike a balance. And third, and probably not surprising to anyone, but also it's something we do have to sort of address, is that the sensitivity is going to be sky position dependent, uh, both depending on the primary beam sensitivity, obviously as we move further away from zenith where it's less sensitive, but also in terms of the actual tracked position through the primary beam, that changes with time as well. So we have to take those all into account. And here are some visualizations of that. So these are primary beam maps, I'm sure MWA members are pretty familiar with these kinds of looking weird lobey things. Um, on the left is an observation at Zenith, on the right is an observation far from Zenith, um, and then there's three traces on them going from blue to red to pink, and these are sort of tracking a, a given RA and DEC, so a particular pulsar source, through the observing duration. Um, and so you can see here on the left, for instance, this red patch, which is when the 80 minutes is act when we're actually sort of observing, it crosses into the beam null and comes out into a side lobe. So maybe we should really only beam form the first half of this. Whereas uh, at lower declinations, something that uh, we're less sensitive, but also just because of the sky motion of the sources, we kind of stay within the main lobe a lot more, which makes sense given the sky motion of the sources. Um, and sort of builds up the sensitivity with time. But it's, we have to, again, sort of figure out what does this actually mean for our sensitivity. And one way we can visualize this in this way, this is a different coordinate system. I've now gone from 
alt as to RA and deck. Um, and essentially what these heat maps are saying is that if you pick any point on this map, any RA and deck, and you integrate a smart observation for the 80 minutes, this is the effective sensitivity you get relative to the best possible uh, in this case. And so we can make these maps for all of our um, actual observations and predict what we're going to see. And so you may, <laughs> that may not be surprised that we're most sensitive at Zenith and we're not so sensitive really even with the longer dwell times at the lower declinations. Other considerations we have to make is, I mentioned as well, we're processing eight times the data and we're forming more tight array beams. So that uh, is a significant challenge in terms of compute and managing our data. Um, we're also moving to process all of our calibration observations with hyperdrive and, and beam forming voltages with a new VCS beam. Um, we're going to be adding some new search methods into our pipeline so that it allows us to extract more science but also adds a lot more processing. Um, and essentially, at this point is just to say that combining these will probably increase our compute costs by an order of magnitude or more. Um, and so already, just from eight times the data and adding more processing, we're already at 80 times the processing we're already doing, which is becoming quite scary considering we're using 2 million CPU hours or something like that in Monster currently. So times that by 80. Um, the other thing we have to do is ensure that our database is complete and tracks all of the processing stages. Obviously, there's a lot of moving parts in this sort of processing, this survey, and we need to be able to track all of that and keep good, have good bookkeeping. So the goal is that we should be able to essentially not even touch the supercomputer and just ask the database, what's happening with this uh, with SMART currently, and it should give us the full uh, view. That's the goal. Obviously, it won't start out that way, but we'll get there, I'm sure. <laughs> anyway, in summary, um, SMART is going to be, the, the deep pass is going to be starting in April 2023, and here is an actual picture of me. Um, the shallow pass was a great success and produced a whole bunch of new pulsars, and we still have a lot left to do. Uh, and the, but the deep pass is going to be a huge increase in data and processing and um, management. And so we're exploring those currently. How do we best deal with those? Um, and how do we exploit the data while it's in hand or on the disk so we don't have to keep moving data around Australia? Um, and obviously, lots of the considerations that are going into this also map directly onto SKA low pulsar surveys. So we'll be exploring more of those as well uh, later down the track. But uh, otherwise, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, perfect timing. I was just about to give you a warning. So uh, amazing. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to raise your hand or put it in the chat and I'll have a look. Um, in the meantime, again, I will shamelessly abuse my power as uh, <laughs> as the chair of the session. Um, I have a quick question. I'm not uh, definitely deaf not an expert in um, dispersion and dispersion measures in general, um, but do you notice or is it something that you have to be aware of um, with the heading into the solar maximum with the ionosphere potentially blurring signals out more? Um, is that something you're taking into consideration? Uh, the solar wind probably for us isn't an issue because we're observing at night uh, normally, so I understand that that's still, they're still there, but I don't think that that's not going to be the biggest issue for us. The biggest issue is really the probing, so kiloparsec distances and dealing with that kind of smearing. A little bit of wobble here and there, doesn't really matter. A full cool. search part of side of things. Follow up, maybe, but for the search part, no. Okay, cool. Very interesting. Um, any other questions? I'll just give everyone the last second. can't see anything so let's thank Bradley again for that update thank you Bradley uh, and I know that Jun is online so Jun if you would like to share your screen and get ready so Jun will be telling us uh, about the targeted search for um, repeating FRBs so Jun take it away thank you uh, can you see my slides yep can see your slides and hear you fine thanks okay so uh, welcome to my talk. So I'm going to uh, introduce my work about uh, target search for repeating fast video burst with the MWA. 
and my collaborators include uh, Jim Anson, Paul Hancock, James Miller Jones, and also a few people from the Pulsar group. So uh, first, I'd like to introduce the FRB search at low frequencies. So as you know, uh, nowadays uh, we have discovered so many FRBs, and most of them are discovered by CHAM. So uh, the most FRB detections are made uh, frequencies from like uh, 300 megahertz to 8 gigahertz. And the only detection of FRBs at low frequencies below 300 megahertz it's FRB 2018-0916-B, and this is a special FRB because it has a period of 16 days and an activity window of 5 days. So, so far this is the only detection uh, at low frequencies, although there are a lot of efforts to search for FRBs at low frequencies. Uh, however, the FRB search at low, frequ low frequencies are very important because it can provide a probe for FRB spectrum, and it can also uh, provide valuable information on the FRB energetics and emission mechanism. Also, it can let us uh, study the FRB environment. So uh, we need to ask, uh, uh, are there more uh, uh, FRBs at low frequencies that we can uh, detect? And so uh, here is, uh, the first big FRB catalog uh, published by Chan, and in this catalog, it includes uh, 18 repeaters and uh, more than uh, 400 line repeaters. And after uh, going through this uh, FRB catalog, I found that uh, four of these repeaters are visible to the end of A. So uh, 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 basically, these are some targets that can, we can follow up with the MWA to search for the low frequency emission. And here, just a brief uh, cap of the F MWA uh, 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 parameters. So um, the field of view is uh, from 300 uh, square degrees to 1,000 square degree, and the operational frequency is from 80 megahertz to 300 megahertz, and it has a very high time resolution mode with a time resolution of 100 microseconds and frequency resolution of 10 kilohertz. And it also has a typical sensitivity of 100 times k milliseconds. And uh, as uh, already uh, mentioned in uh, Ramesh and also Bradley's talk, there's a smart survey um, that's uh, going on uh, on the MWA. And this smart survey, it searches the, uh, it mainly searches for pulsars in the uh, uh, southern sky, but this uh, smart survey is also produced a lot of uh, high time resolution uh, VSS data. So this VSS data in the MW archive can be used for uh, FRB search. And here I list uh, a bunch of uh, FRB uh, that can be uh, uh, follow up with the MWA. Here I list uh, five repeaters, all of them are discovered by CHAM and one by SCAP. So these are the targets that we can follow up with the MWA. And I also uh, list uh, the burst rates and also the observed fluence of each of these repeaters. So uh, going through the MW archive, I found uh, around 23 hours of this data that can be used to search for the low frequency emission from these five repeaters. And here I give all the observations. And also, uh, for each of these observations, I can derive a minimum detectable flux density so that I can uh, have an idea what kind of sensitivity I can achieve with these observations. So uh, here, I'd like to show uh, 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 some uh, testing I've done on prep pulsar. The left figure shows the single pulse I detected from the crab using my pipeline. And the right figure, it shows an example candidate that I found uh, from the archival research data from one of the repeaters. So as you can see uh, in the right figure, although uh, there's a single pulse uh, picked up by the uh, software, but in the dynamic spectrum, we cannot see a dis no evidence of dispersive sweep. So this is probably a noise caused um, a single pulse candidate.
And uh, so I searched for at least more than 20 hours of VSS data and I detected though uh, uh, FRB emission. And based on this and detection uh, and also the sensitivity I derived for each activation, I can get some fluence upper limits on a low frequency emission of these five repeaters. And based on this fluence upper limit, and also I compare this upper limit to the observed fluence at higher radio frequencies, I can derive some uh, constraints on the spectral index of this F, these uh, five repeaters. If we assume the FRB spectrum can be uh, characterized by a single power law. So uh, the basic conclusion is for the two brightest FRBs in this sample, this is the FRB 1907A and 2011-24A. So these two brightest FRBs, our fluence upper limit uh, uh, suggests the spectral index is shallower than uh, minus one. Uh, other than uh, the FRB search, I will I will also like to talk about the future prospect for uh, FRB search is using the MWA. So, uh, as I uh, mentioned at the beginning, the FRB 2018-0916B, this is the only event that has uh, shown a low frequency emission. And um, this kind of FRB is a perfect candidate to follow up with the MWA because it has a uh, a uh, well-defined period so that we can target the active window. However, this FRB is, is in the northern sky, so we cannot observe it with the MWA. But it is instructive to explore the detectability of the low far detected bursts by the MWA if these bursts appear in the MWA field of view. And this figure, it shows a uh, the uh, 18 bursts detected by LOFA is uh, indicated by the cross, and also the dashed line is uh, represent sensitivity of the MWA with the blue uh, the blue dashed line. It represents sensitivity of the uh, archival VSS data used in our search, because uh, the archival data that we used. It's not the maximum sensitivity we can achieve with the MWA. I also plot the red dashed line to show the typical sensitivity if we point at the Z lead. So as we can say, uh, with the um, uh, optimal uh, sensitivity, we should be detect the 12 burst of the low far uh, burst. That, that's uh, around 70% uh, of the low frequency burst from this uh, repeater. So uh, that means in the future, if a similar event happens in the southern sky, we have a very high chance of detecting the low frequency emission. And in a summary, so we searched uh, 23 hours of VSS data for low frequency emission from our five repeating FRBs. And no uh, low frequency emission is detected, which could imply that the FRBs were not active during the end of the observations. Or the spectrum is too shallow for the environment absorbs the low frequency emission. However, we demonstrate that the potential of the MWA in a future follow up of repeaters for uh, detecting low frequency FRBs. That's my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Jun. Uh, very interesting talk. Really cool to see um, the potential application of, of the MWA in this sort of um, this area. So again, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to raise your hand or um, put a question in the chat. I'll just have a quick look. Um, I have another quick question myself. So um, could you go back to the slide where you had your comparison of this, the crab and your target? Yes. yes, this one. Um, so uh, we were saying that there might be the peak there, but there's no sweep in the example candidate. Um, is that, I mean, looking for the crab one or the testing on the crab, do you expect to see a sweep as well? Am I just not seeing it because I have bad eyes or is there not meant to be as much of a sweep for crab? Uh, uh, this uh, <coughs> is already dispersed. So you can... Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it makes a lot more sense. I thought, I thought it was very weird that crab had no sweep. Okay, <laughs> thank you. That, that makes a lot more sense. Um, does anyone else have any questions for John? Give everyone a second. Uh, otherwise, I, I guess I do have another quick question. So um, the MWA at Zenith, um, 
uh, you were saying that you know we have the potential to pick up 70% of the the verse for that that example um, how quickly does that fall off as we move away from Zenith? Is it sort of we're only really likely to pick them up at Zenith or if we're slightly off, are we still going to grab some or what's what's the issue? Uh, I, I haven't uh, investigated that on the sensitivity vary with the pointing. Okay. I think cool. even uh, you can say in the blue reading, that's our not the optimal sensitivity we can still pick up like uh, seven bursts from the low bar example. So that's mm -hmm. about 40%. So even in the, if, even, even if we point away from the zenith, we still have some good chance of detecting the low frequency burst. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. That's good to see. Um, all right. Last chance for anyone to get their questions in. I'm not seeing anyone. I can't see anyone with a hand up in the room there. So, okay, thank you, John. Uh, another round of applause. Thank you. Um, and uh, Parul, are you online? Yeah, I'm online. Yep. Cool. Um, yeah, if you could share your screen, that'd be great. Is it working? That's it. All right. So take it away and tell us all about this uh, very curious pulsar. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, hello everyone. My name is Parul. I'm a final year PhD student at the Indian Institute of Technology Indore in India. Um, today I want to give you a short review on our ongoing work on the study of Pulsar J8, J0026-1955, which was independently discovered in the SMART survey last year. So Pulsars, as we know, are rotating neutron stars, which have highly coherent beams of radiation coming from their magnetic poles. And the most common analogy is that to a lighthouse where, as an observer, you see beams of light from the lighthouse every once in a while. We call these beams um, pulses and they are highly periodic, which is a characteristic feature of pulsars. Um, these pulses that you see from the pulsar are not perfectly same. They have varying features like their amplitude and shape. And this variability in the signal tells us a lot about the pulsar and the medium between the pulsar and us. So sometimes when we stack these seemingly variable individual pulses on top of each other, we start to see orderly structures. So on the right hand side, you would see nice structures forming when we stack all the single pulses. However, the average profile at the top in the blue is pretty unaffected by all of those small variations. This is one more reason why we are looking at single pulses and uh, why it could give us more information about the pulsar emission. These slanted features that you see forming in the pulse stack are the second kind of periodicity that we see in a good fraction of pulsar population. It was first noticed in 1968, quickly after the discovery of the first pulsar. And the phenomena is called subpulse drifting. The subpulse refers to the substructure within a pulse and the drifting corresponds to the slanted features that we see once we stack all of these single pulses. And therefore, subpulse drifting is when we see the substructures varying in phase in a defined periodic manner. The very first theory that tried to explain subpulse drifting uh, very early on 1975, the carousel model, uh, it was called, suggested the presence of sparks near the pulsar surface are arranged in a fairground carousel pattern along the magnetic field axis, as you can see in the uh, beautiful animation by Sam. Uh, the sparks are formed when a potential drop develops around the polar cap region along the open magnetic field lines and the high energy curvature radiation from any charge which is entering this region spontaneously produces electron positron pairs, which produces more pairs and there is uh, an avalanche going on until um, no more pair production can happen because you know the energy is so less. So these sparks are basically locations of these pair production avalanches. And due to the E cross B drift, these sparks rotate around the magnetic axis at a period which is generally different from the pulsar period. And with each pulsar rotation, the emission beam um, would present a slightly ro rotated pattern of sub beams as the line of sight cuts through it. So therefore, consequently, the geometry of the emission beam would be a carousal of sub beams 
circling around a common point in the pulsar sky instead of a static cone of emission. Again, you can see this in this beautiful animation that uh, Sammy provided. So um, this is uh, on the right hand side is a nice example of what traditional suppose drifting would look like. Every time the pulsar's beam comes in our line of sight, there will be a slightly rotated carousal and we'll see the drifting pattern forming in the pulse stack. Um, on the right hand side of what you see is a real pulse stack and you can notice how similar each of the drift sequences uh, look to the simulated one um, in the center. And all of these intricacies are again an opportunity to study variation in pulsar magnetosphere, which ultimately help in understanding the pulsar emission. Coming back to the main source. Uh, so last year, the MWA independently discovered a suppose drifting pulsar under the SPART survey. The pulsar had a period of 1.3 seconds and shows suppose drifting. It also has a very high nulling fraction of more than 70%, making it difficult to observe because it is not on all the time. Um, the lower panel gives an example of suppose drifting and nulling shown by the pulsar as observed with the UGMRT at 400 megahertz. Uh, this is from one of our observations. So you can notice here the beautiful drifting patterns in the lower panel um, and the large sections of time where the pulsar does not emit. The large chunk is also missing at the end, about 10, 12 minutes of our observations uh, because of high RFI. So talking about observations, um, we observed this pulsar later last year using the dual frequency bands at the UGMRT. These observations were not simultaneous, but they were made in a very special way. The GMRT, uh, GMRT's design has a central square of antennas and another set spread out in a Y shape around that center. A set of antennas, including the central square and a few from the Y shaped arms formed a sub array and the rest of the antennas and the leftover Y shaped arms uh, form another sub array. And the pulsar was observed in the phased array mode by these two sub arrays. The idea here was to localize the pulsar's position. So the central close by antennas were looking at a larger space, while the outer set of antennas, which had a much smaller field of view. So we have looked at the ginormous amount of band three data that we got from these observations. Unfortunately, band four observations had too much RFI, and we are still trying to um, find a way to make them work. And the analysis shown in the rest of the slides is mainly from uh, band three. Like I said before, the, we found that the pulsar nulls heavily uh, with a large nulling fraction of about 77% as calculated using the MWA data. Uh, in that sense, the UGMRT data is not different and the pulsar does show um, very long and short nulls. The interesting bit here is that the drift bands evolve meaning that we see individual drift bands getting farther or closer with each pulse within a mode. I'll expand upon this in the uh, future slides. So a, a bit of math, hold on. Uh, we have tried to model the evolution of these drift bands using two models, the quadratic model and the exponential model. The quadratic model accounts for the quadratic behavior of pulses across a drift band. Here, phi is the pulse phase, P is the pulse number, and is the number of um, pulses in a drift band. Most of the drift bands were fitted using this model and um, you know, they were fitted up to a very high degree of accuracy. However, some drift bands did not follow the quadratic model and we used an exponential model for them. The exponential model assumes an exponential decay rate for the drift rate. Uh, D is the drift rate. Uh, here P is the pulse number since the onset of the drift sequence. So we have a full sequence of one mode. Um, so the onset of the drift sequence that is the pulse number P. Tau R is the drift rate relaxation time. D0 is the difference between the asymptotic drift rate, as in whatever happens at the very end, and the drift rate at the onset of the drift sequence, the drift rate that we started with. And the last equation on this page um, shows the rate of change of subpulse phase with pulse number P, drift band number D, and the longitudinal separation between subpulses between successive drift bands P2. Um, don't worry if this is too much math, please look at Sammy's papers and I am sure you'll be able to understand. So after deciding the mode boundaries and fitting each of the modes with either a quadratic model or an exponential model, 
we ended up making two definite kinds of drift modes for this pulsar. Out of the two modes, mode A has, the sl has a slow uh, drift period, meaning that the drift bands are farther apart. This is the most common drift mode that is found in this pulsar. And um, this mode sometimes shows an evolving behavior as well, uh, what I've been talking about so far. And I'll tell you about it in the next slide. This mode also has quite an organized drifting pattern. Um, however, we do see some kinks in the drift band, as in the drift band is not perfectly um, straight. It's going here and there sometimes. Uh, the other one is mode B, which has a faster drift rate than mode A uh, and is much less common. We have not yet seen any kind of drift band mode evolution um, in this mode, though similar to mode A, there are some kinks sometimes in the drift band. Now, the most interesting bit about this pulsar, um, one of the most interesting bits about the pulsar is the evolution of drift bands. And there are a couple of kinds of drift band evolutions that are going on in this pulsar. Mode A is sometimes seen to evolve to a slower drift rate. It starts with something and that, then it evolves to something with a, um, a slower drift rate and and the drift sequences, drift modes are much farther apart, um, though it does not always evolve, as I showed in the last slide. The pulsar also sometimes shows something like a resetting of a drift rate. Here, the pulsar suddenly starts to drift faster and then again evolves to a slower drift rate. So both of those are mode A, um, what you see here and here, but there is some kind of a boundary where this resetting takes place. The third kind of evolution is when the pulsar is seen to evolve from a slower to a faster drift rate. And this one happens right before the pulsar is about to null. And um, that is the interesting, very, very interesting bit here. Whenever the pulsar is about to null, we always see it to drift faster from whatever its drift rate was. Um, another interesting thing to note here is that um, the drift sequences are almost always connected even if there is a mode change. You can see that by following the white fitted lines across the drift mode boundary, but the boundaries are black dashed lines. We are currently working to study the evolution of drift rate within each mode, and we are seeing interesting bits there. It is a work in progress, so please do look out for the paper, hopefully in a couple of months. Um, one must also note that the multiple modes, mode evolution and nulling are not the kind of features that are found in every supposed drifting pulsar. So for this particular pulsar, looking at all of these features, a drift model with um, a drifting model with a changing carousal rotation rate, um, like shown in the animation again, can explain um, the evolution of drift mo drift uh, modes. Does that kind of model explain drifting in all supposed drifting pulsars? That is still a question, and we should be looking um, for an answer. So here is again something that I found interesting. Um, we found instances of what might look like memory across nulls. Uh, these are the sequences where the pulsar goes into a null state. And after it's back, it resumes um, the drifting where it left off. The yellow dashed dotted lines show you the null region. It is almost as if the drifting was happening in the background all the time, but due to some reason, the emission was obscured for a few pulses, and then we stopped seeing the emission for a while. In all of these sequences, the white lines are to guide your eye to see um, this drift band forming. Um, there isn't really a way of knowing if this memory across nulls exists for long nulls, since the error bar becomes too large after some pulses. Um, that being said, there is definitely some very concrete evidence that this pulsar retains suppulse memory across nulls. Um, if you think that's the only interesting bits about this pulsar, you're wrong, I believe. Um, there is much more that this pulsar has to offer. It is a mysterious one with showing all kinds of drifting features. For example, this, where we see an extra drifting component flaring up at the leading end, as in the left-hand side um, in this whole feature. We have seen this kind of drifting in multiple observation scan and have no reason to think that this is a one-off. The pulsar is a mysterious one in this sense and poses a lot of questions that are yet to be answered. And there is more to be figured out. 
And while I'm talking about the mysterious things that we have found in the data, let me tell you about this feature that we saw in a very small frequency range. It surprised me at first, and I thought, aha, FRB, but then I looked at the frequency axis. Um, um, by the way, this is after the dispersion. I was curious to see where it came from, and I narrowed, narrowed it down to the short signal over here. Uh, the pulsar is nulling during this time, therefore you don't see any um, pulsar signal in this chunk. Uh, by the way, in the um, plot above this one, the um, features on the right hand side that shows the pulsar. Uh, so I went ahead to get a, a frequency versus phase plot for this, this particular pulse. And I found this much, this many features in addition to what you see at the uh, top left. Um, and you see there are a lot of sweeps and you can see a lot of frequency sweeps with both frequency squared and frequency minus two uh, dependence, frequency raised to the power minus two. And it definitely didn't look like a real signal, but we are still bamboozled by what it is. So let me know if you have seen anything like this. Um, for now, I have just removed it from our data because it doesn't look real. Um, let me just quickly summarize our work so far on J0026 minus 1955. After the pulsar was first independently discovered and studied by MWA, we have made observations at higher frequencies using the UGMRT. Um, in our analysis, we have found at least two distinct subpulse drifting modes, which show evolving features to both slower and faster drift rates. We also noticed a change in the drifting behavior right before the pulsar nulls, and the pulsar was found to null for about 70% of the times, and also shows possible cases of memory across nulls. Um, we believe that the rare but very useful combination of suppose shifting, mode changing, and nulling are among the most promising phenomena that can help us in understanding the pulsar emission mechanism. The relation between suppose shifting and nulling is worth exploring, and it directly gives information about the pulsar emission. Um, lastly, given the 1975 carousel model does not explain every observed suppose shifting feature, we should be looking for either improvements to the model or new theories. Um, that's it. Thank you so much for listening to me. I'm open for any questions, comments, uh, or uh, discussions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a big round of applause for Paro. Um, that was really interesting. Um, what a great talk. Thank you. Uh, I'll just see if anyone has any questions online or in the room. Ah, yes, so we see one from Nicole in the chat. We've seen some sweeping RFI signals as well in EOR data to know exactly what they are, though. So at least you're not the only one, it seems, dealing with these oh, right. weird sweeping signals. <laughs> yeah. Um, very odd to see. Uh, if anyone else doesn't have a question, I'll give another second in case anyone wishes to put their hand up or type something out. Otherwise, I have a question. Um, you kind of started to, to answer it. I was going to ask if um, we saw yeah. the same uh, pulse drifting after the nulling, and then the next slide you <laughs> talked exactly about yeah. that. So very interesting. Um, but the um, given it starts to speed up just before the nulling, um, do you see it sort of more consistent with that sped up drifting um, when it sort of turns back on after the nulling? Yes. Does, does that make sense um, as a question? <laughs> uh, so after it starts back nulling, it, um, the drift rate, drift rate usually changes. It's not the same slow one. Right, it's okay. It's from a, a, a slower one, I would say. And okay. uh, you know, then if it wants to null again, it starts to drift faster. Um, yeah, like that. So far, I've been so doing some gestures and didn't realize that my camera was off. <laughs> oh, I see. I think I, I still can't see. Oh, no, there you are. Back again. All right. Um, so, yeah, so it starts off <clears throat> slow, then speeds up, goes into its yeah. null, and then when yes. it returns, it's back in the slow, but still consistent. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Cool. Wow. Really interesting. Um, does anyone else have any last questions? No, it seems not. Um, so another round of applause. Thank you so much. That was a very, very interesting talk. Very cool to see. And definitely a mysterious pulsar for sure. Um, so Susmita, so our final talk of the project meeting. Um, I see, yep, there you are, Susmita. Um, 
well, yeah, take us home, finish off the uh, the conference before management sign off, obviously. But um, Susmita, take it away. Thank you. Is slides fine? Yep, can see your slides and can hear you fine. Amazing. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sushmita. I'm a third year PhD student here at Curtin, working with Ramesh, Martin, and Emil. So I'm going to talk to you about something a little bit different from the plots that we have seen in the past couple of talks. So I work on image-based searches for PALSA candidates using MWBCS data. And I am going to start off with a traditional slide of what pulsars are. So just as a recap, pulsars are rapidly rotating neutron stars. They are very dense and highly magnetized with beams of radiation from the magnetic poles, which we detect as pulses. And they are generally very steep spectrum sources. And now these pulses are, have been detected by a traditional methods, which is employing time domain uh, search techniques for the past decade or so, in which we look at these uh, pulses or these profiles to determine whether a particular source is a pulsar or not. And like I mentioned in the slide, they are extremely sensitive and they actually led to the majority of pulsar discoveries till date. However, on the other side, they are actually computationally expensive and time consuming, as well as negatively affected by factors such as dispersion measures, scattering, multipart scattering and smearing, especially at low frequencies, like Natasha mentioned in her talk. So now I focus my work on something a bit different, that is image based searches, which may not be as sensitive as traditional searches, but are ve is very time efficient as well as require less computational resources, in which we look at images to determine whether a particular source is a potential pulsar candidate or not. On the other hand, uh, they are also more likely to detect pulsars which may, be, may have a scatter broadened profile or may be at a very high DM and very hard to detect at low frequencies. So I mainly work with uh, archival data with MWA. Now we all know about MWA, but something that I want to again point out, like Natasha in her talk, is the large field of view of MWA that provides us with a huge range of opportunities to look at the whole sky at once. And the other thing that I have highlighted in the slide is the voltage capture system, which is very, very important for my work uh, in image domain searches. And I'll get to that in the next slide. So MWVCS data is unique in the way that it captures uh, voltages and that voltages gives us maximum data processing flexibility. What that means is that uh, one observation can be taken and put through the beam former to form a tide array beam, which is very useful for traditional pulsar search or Fourier domain searches. In the same way, that very same data can again be put through a correlator, imaged uh, a whole sky image in Stokes I and Stokes V parameters, which can then be used to determine whether the sources that we see in the image are pulsars or not. And why is that actually important? Because pulsars are uh, very, uh, very, very significantly from day to day, especially at low frequencies, such a work using NWVCS data in which you find a candidate in an observation, and then you can use the same observation using beam forming to vet for those candidates is extremely useful and one of the unique capabilities of NWA. My work mainly focuses on the later part in which I deal with the imaging domain of MWVCS data. So initially before I started my PhD, there was no coherent pipeline that would take these MWVCS data in the rawest form and pop out the images for us to do all of the beautiful analysis that we can do. With the help of my supervisor, Martin Sokolowski, we now have a coherent pipeline that runs pretty much independently without a user from, end, uh, from starting to end, giving us the Stokes images that we can use to further our uh, analysis. The last few blocks, that is uh, running agent, which is the uh, source finding software, software and then eventually creating a catalog to do further analysis is something that uh, I do by myself. But until the mean and RMS images, 
everything is done by the pipeline and has been tested and developed on multiple MW observations still now. In the next couple of months, I aim to convert this whole pipeline uh, with uh, to a next flowed pipeline because it's been uh, told that it's extremely good and it will make it more independent and doesn't need the user to do any sort of uh, uh, changes or doesn't need the user to even be there to process it. So that is something that I'll be doing in the next couple of months. Uh, now, what do we exactly get out of this pipeline? So I would like to, oh, my slides are oh, ah, yeah, there you go. I would like to quickly showcase this uh, image here that we get out of the pipeline. And it's one of the best images that we have got until now with MWVCS data. So this is a snapshot of the great bigger image that we have. And in the bigger image, we see a range of sources from uh, point sources to extended supernova remnants, AGN. And we can see in this image the galactic plane passing right through the center. And this gives us a combination of 9,000 sources in the image once you run AGN with the RMS of 5 millijansky per beam. Like I mentioned before, it is one of the best ones that we have got until now with MWVCS data. And so what exactly I do when I get these 9,000 sources, I uh, take my integrated uh, flux and my uh, peak flux and just choose the compact sources because pulsars are just compact sources and I'm only interested in them at the moment. So, but how many pulsars can we actually detect with this method? So one of the comparisons that I initially did for one of the observations was to compare the number of imaging detections to the number of detections we get out of beamforming. Now in the plot that I have shown here, uh, in orange are the periodic search detections, that is the traditional searches. In uh, black dots are the imaging detections and the circled ones are the ones that are detected by both. And here I have put a DM cutoff for traditional searches with MWVCS data. Beyond, this, not, this is not to say that beyond this we won't be able to detect any pulsar, it just means that the sensitivity reduces significantly. And then we also have a flux cutoff coming from the imaging detections. Now, as you see in the plot, a lot of the periodic detections also happen in the region where the imaging detections are not very good. However, there is this whole parameter space where imaging detections dominate over periodic detections. And that is exactly the area which my work focuses on. I aim to detect very bright pulsars and at high TM or which may be highly scattered at low frequencies. So given that we have these imaging detections, given that imaging detections dominate on a certain parameter space, it means that we are not running a buggy pipeline and that it's running fine and we were able to redetect a lot of the pulsars for all of the observations that we processed till now. So the next step was to go ahead and determine how to uh, check whether the sources, the radio sources that we are looking at is actually a pulsar or not. So for doing that, I come up with three particular criteria. The first one being spectral index. Now for spectral index criteria, the requirement is that you have a reference catalog and then you have your base catalog. In our case, life is a little bit easier. I already have my base catalog as the MW sources. So as the reference catalog, I use the RACS catalog, that is the Rapid ASCAP Continuum Survey catalog, which is the Southern Sky Survey with ASCAP and is the best one till date. So taking the flux values of the sources uh, from RACS and MWA, I can uh, calculate a spectral index for the sources, for sources present in both the catalogs, or at least put a limit on spectral index for sources that are only in MWA. And then moving on, I just pick up the sources that are steeper than minus 1.2. Now you may ask me why I'm choosing this particular minus 1.2. And I point you to this particular plot. So this is a plot of the spectral index distribution of all of the pulsars detected till date. Now if I put my uh, spectral index cutoff minus 1.2 here in blue, I see that I detect, I, I should be in theory be able to detect almost more than 50% of the pulsars that are uh, already recorded, uh, which makes it a good uh, criteria. Now what happens is if I push this minus 1.2 to 3, where the cutoff would be somewhere here, if you can see my cursor. So in that case, we would be detecting a significantly less amount of pulsars, which is not really a good thing if you are testing and developing your criteria. 
So my taking a more higher cutoff is not the way to go. Alternatively, if I push this more down to let's say minus one, we would be detecting only slightly a more number of recorded pulsars. On the other hand, our average candidates here, which is 200 for minus 1.2, would shoot significantly up, requiring more computation resources and more time to process the data by a significant amount. So that is why, as of now, for all the observations, minus 1.2 seems to be the most sensible cutoff to get for the spectral index criteria. And with this, we, have, we are able to redetect at least 50% for pulsars for all the observations processed till now. So that makes spectral index criteria a good way of detecting whether a particular source is a possible pulsar candidate or not. Now, the second one is circular polarization. Sami has given a wonderful talk about circular pol on polarization. And I will just take it a little bit further and say, in the imaging domain, how do I exactly try, uh, characterize this uh, leakage is that I take the values of V by I, which is the fractional circular polarization, and then uh, fit a surface to it. So any, any source that is above the model that's fitted to the uh, V by I fractional circular polarization is actually a very interesting candidate, uh, which should be followed up later on. So I take all sources that have so, uh, fractional polarization more than 7%. And one of the test cases that we had was J0034 pulsar, which has a circular polarization. So on the left here, I see I show a Stokes I image. And on Stokes V, the only source that's left behind is that particular pulsar at the correct position. So we had a very small sample to test for circular polarization uh, for the observations that I have already processed. But we were able to detect almost uh, all of the pulsars that we should be detecting. It does give us a less number of candidates though, which may be a boon or a curse if you think of it. A boon in the sense that if you get less number of candidates, you have less uh, number of candidates to follow up. In, on the other hand, uh, it may be that we are missing some very interesting sources that we should be getting. And one way to deal with it is to better characterize the leakage, which is an effort that has been uh, spread around whole of MWN. So with a better characterization and a better beam model, we will be able to improve the criteria furthermore and will be able to detect more pulsar candidates in circular polarization domain. And the last one that we came up with is variability. Now, variability is very, very important. And uh, like I mentioned before, pulsars vary even on a day-to-day -day basis. So I check variability in terms of seconds. So I check it in three time scales, 300 seconds, 60, and 30. And so I then I apply some uh, variability statistics to these images. And finally, what pops out are the light curves. The light curves, just to... Uh, not take up too much space. I only produce light curves for sources that have a modulation index more than 20% and a chi-square more than 5 sigma. Uh, these uh, cutoffs are based on previous work done with NWA variability by Martin Bell and Tara Murphy. And one of the test cases that we popped up was J0034-0721, which is a variable pulsar. Uh, and we could see the variability in the images as well as in the light curves. Uh, the candidates that I get out of variability looks like something like this if you make a GIF out of it. So the source pops up in one image, completely goes off, and then comes back on. And it's more, more aimed at detecting pulsars which show high nulling, fraction, or scintillation. And we were able to unbiasedly detect 034 minus 0721. However, we also have to take in uh, take care of the imaging artifacts at MW frequency, which may pop up, uh, pop up as a variable source, but further investigation would rule it out as just a spurious detection. So that has to be kept in mind when you're looking at these variability curves. On saying that, what do I exactly do with once I get all these sources? So these three criteria give me three different uh, sets of sources, which I then go back to the observations and form a beam and do a periodic search. Now, I am going back to periodic search, but the comparison would be initially doing a periodic search on every single pixel of the image, 
would be around uh, 100,000 pixels, whereas here I would be searching only for 1,000 pixels uh, in total for maybe four observations. So we are reducing the computational uh, pressure on the supercomputers uh, by uh, orders of magnitude. So that is one way of going, which I have done for all of the sources that I showed you. Uh, alternatively, I can't possibly go to parks and ask them for uh, observation time for 1,000 sources. So I have to cull down the sources to orders of 10s or 20s. So then I lo start looking for sources which show more than one characteristic. Maybe they have a steep spectral index and also variable or steep spectral index and circularly polarized. And I rank them accordingly. And then I go to parks and uh, I get some time on parks and observe them. And then do the usual parks processing to see whether they, um, they show pulse pulsar-like signals or not. And this is just a snapshot of one of the very early observing sessions that I had very, very recently. Alternatively, on the other hand, uh, I also, uh, aim, like in the next few months, I also aim to finish processing MW archival observation, VCS observations that uh, cover the whole galactic plane. And we already have been getting some very interesting uh, results out of it, very interesting sources that I am currently following up with Parks uh, with the help of Natasha. So to summarize altogether, uh, we have now demonstrated the capability of MWVCS data and in whole MWA to detect Pulsar candidates in imaging domain. And all the three methods that I showed you today has been uh, curated and tested on multiple MWA observations. We were able to detect all the pulsars that we expect to detect uh, in these observations. And up until now, we have not found any new pulsations from the candidates in MWVCS data. But we are currently following up a set of candidates with parks. One of the work, uh, one of the things that is uh, ongoing work is to improve the leakage characterization for MWVCS data that Sami talked about. About, and which would help me to improve my criteria or at least to determine whether the sources I'm seeing is actually true or not. And in the next couple of months, I will be applying these uh, techniques to uh, 12 to 15 MWVCS observations that cover the galactic plane and hope to detect pulsar candidates. I would end by saying that given that MWA is a SKLO precursor, the ability uh, to demonstrate that MWA will be able to detect is detecting pulsars in imaging domain actually opens up a whole new avenue for SKLO where we would be getting data, high time resolution data and continuum images. So uh, hopefully more pulsar candidates to come in the near future. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Susmita. Great talk. Um, cool. So again, if you have any questions, feel free to put your hand up or raise them in the chat and I will echo them for everyone. Um, I'm not seeing any immediate hands coming up, so uh, I will ask again one of my own questions. Um, I'm a sucker for, for scintillation, so um, the light curves that you have for the sources that you find as variable, do you think it's possible that in the future having more of these and using the image domain, um, we could start to get uh, estimates of that scintillation to use for, um, I think Ramesh kind of touched on it a bit in the summary as well, um, updating our models of, of um, the line of sight uh, uh, maps. I can't think of the words, my brain's frozen. Is that question getting across? Did that make sense? <laughs> Yes, uh, that does make sense. Obviously, if we see more of these sources scintillating, then we will be able to model the ISM better. Uh, I, I don't think that's directly related to uh, my PhD project, but uh, eventually, if I find lots of these sources, that could potentially become a good way to follow, to uh, see how the, uh, how the ISM is changing for different sources at different parts of the observation. Yeah, cool. Very, very interesting. Um, really great to see. Uh, are there any other questions from anyone? It's your last chance, so get in while you can. I don't see anyone. Um, so can we have a round of applause for for Sir Mina and then for all of the speakers in this last session? Um, great job, everyone. So big round of applause. Thank you. Um, really interesting to see all the stuff going on with uh, fast transients and, uh, and pulsars. So thank you, everyone. And I will pass over to Mia and management for our wrap up. Thanks.
Thanks, Kat. And um, thanks everyone for, for coming today. Yeah, folks. Sorry, that, 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 was, that noise was me trying to share the, the final slide. Um, I want to say thanks probably most importantly for the collaborative spirit that has been demonstrated yesterday and today. Uh, for example, I mean, we had Randall and uh, Devajoti stepping up to do talks on behalf of Divya and, and Yajan. Uh, we had Devajoti again helping uh, Pooja by sharing her slides when there were technical difficulties. We had uh, Rahima and Ash and, and Venus, they were pulled in last minute as session chairs and did such a wonderful job. Um, Ramesh, as always, for, for help for, for asking helpful questions at the end of talks. Um, it's just such a, a wonderful group and team feeling. So, so thanks again. We still have awards to give out. So I'll put the final list of attendees into a random name picker and I'll send out the result along with uh, links to the meeting recordings on YouTube and the meeting wiki page where you can upload a copy of your slides if you like. And I know it's very late or very early for some people, so I don't think we're going to force everyone to turn their cameras on for a group screenshot. But I will hand over to Chris. I uh, see so he's available. Fantastic uh, for the best talk award. And then Stephen will give some closing comments. Cheers. Cool beans. Thanks, Mia. And thanks everyone for still being here. Um, so best talk. Well, what can I say? The standard was exceptionally high. We've had so many good talks um, emphasizing just how much cool science is coming out of the MWA. And I think as someone, I forget who it was who said it, but someone definitely said it at this meeting, um, you know, delivering on key fantastic science from the nearest star to the first stars. Uh, we had a whole bunch of phenomenal talks, particularly the the, the keynotes emphasizing the importance of exquisite precision calibration and an extensive archive covering years or even decades, um, looking for unexpected uh, phenomena, which of course requires significant resources in terms of computational and human uh, resources. And the, the animation that we showed earlier regarding pulsars and the smart pulsar survey was just absolutely phenomenal. Uh, it was really, really great to see that clear explanation. Um, I started writing a list of honorable mentions, but uh, I stopped pretty quickly because it was rapidly approaching just the list of talks that we had. So to get the to get this uh, wrapped up and put a pin on it, um, the overall winner of the best talk for this end of project meeting goes to Dev Null for their talk on the pathological systematics. Um, an aspect of data exploration that's hugely important for delivering the, the best of the best of MWA science and is absolutely critical, particularly for the EOR folks, as demonstrated by CAP and the team. Um, but not only that, Dev's talk was really well presented, set an excellent standard for animations and sparked off uh, a big discussion um, and exchange of ideas between three of the key science working groups, uh, GEG, EOR, and the pulsars and fast transients groups uh, regarding, yeah, precision calibration and polarimetry. So well done, Dev, um, and yeah, well done, everyone. Thanks, Chris. I hope I hope the discussion leads to a, a solution to the, um, uh, the XY phase cal, um, um, and yeah, I hope these discussions kick off um, more interesting ways of looking at the systematics. So thanks. Really appreciate it. Agreed. And I, I echo your statement and I absolutely expect that this discussion will evolve into something um, that is that is more ongoing on the longer term and well, ongoing on the longer term until we find the solution. Stephen, are you online? I am. I was sitting quietly waiting for my cue. So thank you. Uh, Kaya, everyone. Um, it's been a great two days. Um, as usual, I think the talks have been uniformly exceptional. Um, and I'm really glad that Chris had to make that decision and, and not me, uh, because that was a tough one. Uh, but congratulations, Dev. Um, Actually, the impression that I've taken from 
from the couple of days and across just about all the talks um, and definitely across all the science areas is that after a decade, people are really starting to dig into, into the details of the understanding of the instrument, its performance, uh, the quality of the data, uh, and also the astrophysics as they try and uh, dig deeper and deeper into the astrophysical questions that, that they want to ask. Uh, what I see is an enormous accumulation of not just knowledge, but, but wisdom uh, that goes across the entire system. And I think that little exchange with Chris and Dev on XY um, phase calibration is just a, a really excellent example of how we advance that digging through getting together uh, via meetings like this. And I'd really echo uh, Mia's comments about the collaborative nature of the group and the team. Um, and you know what, that, that's been a feature of this group since day one. I remember the very earliest um, MWA project meetings after we first commenced operations, you know, just about a decade ago. Uh, and that vibe has always been in the team. And I think it has been one of the things that's collectively pushed us on. Um, so congratulations to all of the participants for ma maintaining that and, and collectively exploiting all that knowledge and wisdom. Um, and it, some of the things I've seen over the last two days, the digging into the absolute detail has been absolutely astonishing. Um, and for me personally, at the end of a long year, it really energizes me. Um, so thanks to everyone for that. Um, I mean, I'm hoping next year, um, the mid-year project meeting will mark the 10 year anniversary of the operations of the, the commencement of operations of the MWA. And I'm really hoping that we can, largely speaking, get together uh, face to face for a, a really big celebration um, and just to accelerate some of these interactions uh, and that continued digging into the detail. So I think that's going to be really exciting. Um, and I'm really extremely excited by the fact that we can proceed uh, beyond that point out to the end of the decade with, uh, with an upgraded, bigger, more capable, more robust facility, uh, which I think is exciting for a few different reasons. Um, and in some way, uh, having, having that new improved system relieved of some of the current deficiencies I think it's going to be a whole new world for a lot of you guys. Um, a lot of those tricky systematics and, and problems and details that everyone's had to deal with, um, once they sort of disappear, hopefully, I, I think is going to unveil, um, I won't say an easy new world, um, but one in which all of your work will uh, result in, I think, phenomenally better results across the board. Um, that's the history, that's the history of radio telescopes and, and radio telescope upgrades. Um, so I think that's probably what's going to happen with the MWA. So I'm, I'm really, really pleased that that we're going to be in that position over the next five years um, and have that opportunity to really double down on uh, the wisdom that, that you've all gained. Um, everything from the emerging um, value of the archive in terms of finding those rare uh, sources that weren't necessarily predicted, but the combination of the archive and an instrument to follow up um, has proven itself really, really powerful. Um, so being able to continue that is, is super exciting. Um, I'll leave off there, I think, Mia, um, just to say um, thank you to everyone for their contributions, not just during the meeting, but um, as members of the, the, the MWA team. Um, 
congratulations on a, a great year of work. Um, and I really, uh, really hope to see lots of people in person um, middle of next year for a face-to-face a -face celebration of 10 years of operations um, and uh, a forward look for the next five years. Uh, okay, so uh, thanks very much and back to you, Mia. I think we'll end it there. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, everyone. And um, yeah, <laughs> I hope you all have a, a great holiday time period and um, we'll, we'll end it there. Thanks all. Cheers.